hearing will come to order, please. We'll now recognize our next panels of, uh, panel of witnesses. Mrs. Josephine Terry is the mother of the late Border Patrol agent, Brian Terry. Ms. Michelle Terry is the sister of the late Border Patrol agent, Brian Terry. Mr. Robert Heyer is the cousin of the late Border Patrol agent, Brian Terry. The committee will, would also like to recognize other members of Agent Terry's family, including his father, Kent Terry, who is unable to be here today, his stepmother, Carolyn Terry, his older brother, Kent Terry Jr., and his younger sister, Kelly Terry Willis. Our thoughts today are with Agent Terry and his entire family as they continue to mourn the untimely passing of their loved one. Our remaining witnesses on the second panel are Mr. John, excuse me, Mr. John Dotson. He is a special agent in the Phoenix Field Division of the Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, and Firearms and Explosives. <clears throat> excuse me. Mr. Olindo Lee, as he's known, CASA, is a special agent in the Phoenix Field Division of the Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, and Firearms and Explosives. And Mr. Peter Forcelli is a group su supervisor of the Phoenix Field Division of the Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, Firearms, and Explosives. Ladies and, uh, and gentlemen, pursuant to the rules of our committee, all witnesses are to be sworn in order to testify. Would you please rise to take the oath and raise your right hands. Do you solemnly swear or affirm that the testimony you are about to give will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Let the record ref reflect that all witnesses answered in the affirmative. Please be seated. In order to allow time, particularly with such a large panel, your entire written statements and any in inclusive material you want to have put in the record will be placed in the record. So feel free to, uh, to summarize. Try to stay within five minutes. Uh, for the field agents, we will hold you closer to it. For the mother and sister, not so much. Uh, uh, we'll start with... We'll, we'll start with Mr. Heyer. You're recognized for five minutes. Good morning, Chairman Issa, Ranking Member Cummings, and other members of the committee. My name is Robert Heyer. I am the cousin of slain Border Patrol agent Brian A. Terry. As you know, I'm joined on the panel this morning with Brian's mother, Josephine, and his older sister, Michelle. They have asked me to give this opening statement on behalf of the entire Terry family. It was just 10 days before Christmas last year when our family received the devastating news. Brian had been shot and killed while engaged in a firefight with a group of individuals seeking to do harm to American citizens and others. We knew that Brian faced eminent danger on a daily basis as a part of his chosen career. But we also knew that he and his unit were highly trained and equipped with the best weapons this country could provide to their fighting men and women. They were confident in overcoming any threat that they may face in the desolate section of desert that they patrolled. He and his team prided themselves as being the tip of the spear that defended this country and its borders. The telephone call came in the middle of the night. I know this type of horrible notification has been received many times during the past 10 years by families of our military sons and daughters as the United States has fought wars in both Iraq and Afghanistan. After all, Brian had taken an oath to defend this country from all terrorist threats. What makes Brian's death so shocking to his family is that he did not die on a foreign battlefield. 
He was killed in the line of duty as a U.S. Border Patrol agent. He died not in Iraq or Afghanistan, but in the desert outside of Rio Rico, Arizona, some 18 miles inside of the U.S.-Mexican border. His killers were not Taliban insurgents or Al-Qaeda fighters, but a small group of Mexican drug cartel bandits heavily armed with AK-47 assault rifles. The rifles and the ammunition that they carried in those weapons were designed to do one thing, and that was to kill. Brian was an amazing man. And I say that not just because he was family. Many people thought he was almost superhuman. After his death, we visited his former duty stations in Arizona. Each time we met one of his fellow agents, they spoke of how impressed they were with him. He was what we expect in our brothers and sons, a strong, competitive, handsome, courageous, funny, and incredibly patriotic American. Some of his coworkers even had bestowed him with the nickname of Superman. Brian was very proud to serve as a federal agent. He had joined the United States Marine Corps right after high school. He went on to college and earned a Bachelor of Science degree in criminal justice. He then became a local police officer in the communities of Ecorse and Lincoln Park, Michigan. When he sought to have more of an impact on keeping this country safe, he joined the Border Patrol. Brian, it seemed, had found his niche. Before long, he tried out and became a member of the Border Patrol's elite tactical unit known as BORTAC. At age 40, he had much to look forward to, which included getting married and starting a family. But for now, he was living his dream. He wore his BORTAC winged insignia with great pride and excelled as a BORTAC team member. During BORTAC training, Brian was given a classroom writing assignment. The assignment was to write something about himself that would give the instructors some insight as to who he was. He composed a poem that he entitled, If Today Is To Be The Day, So Be It. I'd like to read you that poem so that you can have a better understanding of the man he was. If you seek to do battle with me this day, you will receive the best that I am capable of giving. It may not be enough, but it will be everything that I have to give. And it will be impressive, for I have constantly prepared myself for this day. I have trained, drilled, and rehearsed my actions so that I might have the best chance of defeating you. I have kept myself in peak physical condition, schooled myself in the martial skills, and have become proficient in the applications of combat tactics. You may defeat me, but I'm willing to die if necessary. I do not fear death, for I have been close enough to it on enough occasions that it no longer concerns me. But I do fear the loss of my honor, and would rather die fighting to have it said that I was without courage. So I will fight you, no matter how insurmountable it may seem, to the death if need be, in order that it may never be said of me that I was not a warrior. Brian was due to complete his shift of duty that night in the desert outside of Rio Rico at midnight on December 15th, and then takes a much deserved time off. He had already made his travel plans to fly back to Michigan and spend the Christmas holiday with his family. Brian's attention to detail had ensured that all the Christmas gifts he had meticulously selected for his family had already been bought and sent in the mail prior to his arrival. Brian did ultimately come home that Christmas. We buried him not far from the house that he was raised in just prior to Christmas Day.
The gifts that Brian had picked out with such thought and care began to arrive in the mail the same week. With each delivery, we felt the indescribable pain of Brian's death. But at the same time, also remembered his amazing love and spirit. We hope that you now know a little bit more about our Brian. We ask that you honor his memory by continuing to ensure what he worked so hard to do and ultimately gave his life doing. That is, to keep this country safe and its borders secure. We hope that the Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, and Firearms is forthcoming with all information that the panel is seeking. We ask that if a government official made a wrong decision, that they admit their error and take responsibility for his or her actions. We hope that all individuals involved in Brian's murder and those that played a role in putting the assault weapons in their hands are found and prosecuted to the full extent of the law. Finally, it's our hope that no more law enforcement officers die at the hands of these heavily armed Mexican drug cartel members operating on and inside the borders of the United States. The Terry family would like to acknowledge and thank the special agents in the FBI's Tucson field office and the prosecutors in the U.S. Attorney's Tucson office that have worked so hard and continue to work in bringing Brian's killers to justice. We would also like to acknowledge the courage and integrity of the three special agents of ATF's Phoenix Field Division sitting with us on this panel. Lee Casa, Pete Forselli, and John Dotson. We recognize the professional risks you face by coming forward and speaking to the public about an investigation that you believe was ill-conceived and reckless. The Marine Corps has the motto of Semper Fidelis, which most of you know is Latin for always faithful. The Border Patrol has the motto of honor first. Brian lived a life of honor, duty, and sacrifice, which reflected both of these models and the two organizations that he was so proud to serve in. It is now up to all of us to put honor first and to remain always faithful in the quest for justice. On behalf of the entire Terry family, thank you. Thank you. Special Agent Dotson, you're recognized for five minutes. Mr. Chairman, Ranking Member Cummings. Please pull the mic a little closer, if you would, please, and make sure it's on. Yes, sir, is that better? Mr. Chairman, Ranking Member Cummings, other honorable members of this committee, I thank you. Beginning with my military service and continuing through to this day, I am proud to have spent nearly my entire adult life in service of this country, under sworn oath to defend its constitution, with my allegiance always pledged to this republic. I have spent the vast majority of my law enforcement career conducting criminal investigations, with a particular focus on those involving the trafficking of narcotics and firearms. I have been involved in countless investigations and arrests, from basic misdemeanors to complex conspiracies of international drug trafficking organizations, many times as an undercover. I have made thousands of investigative stops and scores of arrests and have testified many times in federal and state courts across this country, often as a qualified expert. I do not appear before you as some remote observer of these events, casting a judgmental finger over the actions of others. I come, as I have been asked to do, bearing only my first-hand account. I have not the burdens of rendering judgment, determining responsibility, or holding others accountable. I yield those to this committee. The only message I hope to convey is that through this process, some resolve may finally be brought to the families of Brian Terry and Jaime Zapata, that we may truly honor their service and mourn their sacrifice. I hope that your inquiry and those of Senator Grassley's office and the Inspector General 
will yet yield a true account for the many others on both sides of our border who have already been or will be affected by this operation. Furthermore, I am grateful to have the opportunity to appear here today alongside the Terry family so that I may personally express to them my sorrow and my regret. Simply put, during this operation referred to as Fast and Furious, we, the ATF, failed to fulfill one of our most fundamental obligations to caretake the public trust, in part to keep guns out of the hands of criminals. When I became involved in this operation in late 2009, the ATF agents running it briefed me that the local Phoenix firearms dealers had provided them with a list of more than 40 individuals whom they believed to be purchasing guns for others, straw purchasers. Of these individuals, several were members or believed to have connections with Mexican drug cartels. Those identified straw purchasers were the initial suspects of this investigation. From the earliest days of that operation, after the briefing, I had no question that the individuals we were watching were acting as straw purchasers and that the weapons they purchased would soon be trafficked to Mexico and or other locales along the southwest border or other places in the United States. And ultimately, these firearms would be used in a violent crime. However, we did nothing to intervene. Over the course of the next 10 months that I was involved, we monitored as they purchased handguns, AK-47 variants and 50 caliber rifles, almost daily at times. Rather than conduct any enforcement actions, we took notes, we recorded observations, we tracked movements of these individuals, we wrote reports, but nothing more. Knowing all the while, just days sometimes after these purchases, the guns that we saw these individuals buy would begin turning up at crime scenes in the United States and in Mexico, and yet we still did nothing. I recall, for example, one suspect, as he met with another, received a bag full of cash. That cash, he then proceeded to a local FFL who conducted a transaction of firearms that we had authorized him to do. This straw purchaser then left the fire, federal firearms dealer and met again with that third party and delivered the firearms to him. And still we did nothing. Although my instincts maybe want to intervene and interdict those weapons, my supervisors directed me and my colleagues not to make any stop or arrest, but rather to keep him under surveillance while allowing the guns to walk. Surveillance operations like these were the rules. They were not the exceptions. This is not a matter of some weapons that had gotten away from us or allowing a few to walk so that we could follow them to a much larger, more significant target. Allowing loads of weapons that we knew to be destined for criminals was the plan. This was the mandate. I remember a lecture by Army Lieutenant Colonel Dave Grossman. I borrow from it now. ATF is supposed to be the guardians, the sheepdogs that protect against the wolves that prey upon us, especially along our southern border. But rather than meet the wolf head on, we sharpened his teeth, added number to his claw. All the while we sat idly by watching, tracking, and noting as he became a more efficient and effective predator. Prior to my coming to Phoenix, I had never been involved in or even heard of an operation in which law enforcement officers would let gun walk let guns walk. The very idea of doing so is unthinkable to most law enforcement. I and other field agents involved in this operation repeatedly raised these concerns with our supervisors. In response, we were told that we simply did not understand the plan. I cannot begin to think of how the risk of letting guns fall into the hands of known criminals could possibly advance any legitimate law enforcement interest. I hope the committee will receive a better explanation than I. Thank you again for the opportunity to appear here today before you. And I look forward to answering any questions that any of you may have. Thank you, sir. Mr. Or Special Agent Casa. Good morning, Mr. Chairman. Good morning, Mr. Cummings. Good morning, honorable members of Congress. My name is Olindo James Casa, and I'm a senior special agent with the Bureau of ATF. I've been employed with ATF since March of 1993 as both an inspector and later as a special agent. I'm currently assigned to the Phoenix Field Division, Phoenix Group 7, and OSADF Strike Force Group. I've been assigned to that group since December 2009 to the present. As a special agent with ATF, I've been a case agent, I've been a co-case agent, and I've participated in many firearms tra trafficking investigations, both domestic and international in scope. Needless to say, I feel I have extensive experience in regards to firearms trafficking investigations. My work has resulted in the successful prosecution of many individuals who have violated the law. After reporting to Phoenix Group 7 office in December 2009. I was briefed by group members on the investigation, Fast and Furious. 
shortly after I became aware of what I believed to be unusual and questionable investigative techniques. For instance, I became aware that certain straw purchasers were purchasing numerous firearms from firearm dealers. What I found concerning and alarming was more times than not, no law enforcement activity was planned to stop these suspected straw purchasers from purchasing firearms. The only law enforcement activity that was occasionally taken was to conduct a surveillance of the transaction and then nothing more. As the investigation progressed over the next couple of months, an additional suspected straw purchasers were identified, again with no obvious attempts to interdict the weapons or interview suspects. Around the same time, Phoenix Group 7 office started to receive numerous firearm traces detailing recoveries of firearms in the country of Mexico. Many of those traces to close the aforementioned fire, straw, straw purchasers were responsible for purchasing those recovered firearms. At this time, several special agents in the group, including myself, became increasingly concerned and alarmed at case, Ag case agent Hope McAllister and Group Supervisor Dave Svoth refusal to stop or address the suspected straw purchasers from purchasing additional firearms. Special Agent John Dotson and I con continually raised our concerns directly with the case agent, co-case co -case agent Tanya English and Group Supervisor Voth to no avail. In response to our increasingly voiced concern, the Group Supervisor issued the infamous schism email to the group. In essence, the email was a direct threat to the special agents who were not in agreement on how the case, on how case agent McAllister, co-case agent English, or how Group Supervisor Voth managed the investigation. Based on my 18 years of experience with ATF, I did not think the email was an empty threat. I took it very serious. It has been common practice for ATF supervisors to retaliate against employees that do not blindly toe the company line. Sometime in March 2010, at the direction of Group Supervisor Voth and Case Agent McAllister, daily surveillances of straw purchasers started to be conducted by members of ATF Group 7, as well as ATF special agents from other offices who were detailed to assist with the operation Fast and Furious. ATF Special Agent Lawrence Alt reported to the Phoenix Group 7 office uh, around this period of time, and like Special Agent Dotson and I, became alarmed of the direction of the investigation and spoke out against the practices that were being utilized. My role during these daily surveillances was that of shift supervisor. As a shift supervisor, my responsibility was to oversee surveillance agents at the direction of case agent McAllister, co-case co agent English, and or group supervisor Dave Voth. In general, my fears were realized while out on these aforementioned surveillances. On numerous occasions, the surveillance team followed straw purchasers to Phoenix area firearms dealers and would observe these straw purchasers buy and then depart with numerous firearms in hand. Those firearms included but not limited AK-47 variant rifles, 50 caliber rifles, and 5.7 millimeter FN pistols, all of which are devastating weapons. On many of those occasions, the surveillance team would follow the straw purchasers either to residences, a public location, or until the surveillance team was spotted by straw purchasers, but the end result was always the same. The surveillance was terminated by the case agent, co-case agent, or supervisor without interdicting or seizing the firearms. On several occasions, I personally requested it to interdict or seize the firearms in such a manner that would only further their investigation, but I was always told to stand down and not to seize the firearms. I made these requests over the air and had many law enforcement witnesses that can verify my assertions. Reflecting back to that period of time during the investigation, I thought the poor decisions were made due to incompetency or a lack of experience, which would have made the situation bad enough. Unfortunately, in recent light of documents that have been released, especially the briefing paper dated January 8, 2010, it appears the investigation was conducted in a recklessly planned manner with a specific strategy in mind. Per the briefing paper, the strategy was to allow the transfer of firearms to take place to, in order to further the investigation and allow for the identification of additional co-conspirators who would continue to, to operate and illegal traffic firearms to Mexican drug trafficking organizations. Special Agent Dotson, Special Agent Alt, and I, at times on a daily basis, had warned the case agent, co-case agent, and group supervisor of the reckless course they were taking in regards to the investigation. We sternly warned them of the consequences, consequences of their actions, but were repeatedly ignored. In fact, on at least a couple of occasions, I witnessed Special Agent Dotson asked both Special Agent McAllister and Group Supervisor Voth if they were prepared to attend the funeral of a slain agent or officer after he or she was killed with one of those straw purchase firearms. Neither one answered or even seemed concerned by the question posed to him. To close, I would like to extend my heartfelt, heartfelt condolences to Border Patrol agent Brian Terry's family. I'm truly sorry for your loss. I hope you find peace. Thank you. Special, special Agent for, for, for Chelly. Good morning, Chairman Issa, Ranking Member Cummings, and members of the committee. 
I thank you for the opportunity to appear before the committee today. I'm here to provide testimony that I hope will assist in your inquiry into the investigation um, that has come to be known as Operation Fast and Furious. I believe that your inquiry is essential. There have been grave mistakes made in this case, and the committee, the American people, and the family of slain Border Patrol agent Brian Terry deserve answers. Please allow me to give you a little background information about myself. In 1987, I began my career with the New York City Police Department, worked in Bronx County, often referred to as the Bronx, as a uniformed police officer, and then ultimately as a detective in the Bronx Homicide Task Force. In my career, I estimate that I've responded to approximately 600 homicide scenes. The vast majority were drug-related, committed by armed criminals, and these violent criminals were armed with illegal firearms, and they had little regard for human life. I retired early from the NYPD in June of 2001 to take a position with the Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, and Firearms, as we were then known, and I did this because I had the honor of working with ATF agents who were working and making great cases, uh, working hand-in-hand -hand with incredible prosecutors uh, from the southern and eastern districts of New York. And working with these officers, one thing was very clear. Dedicated prosecutors worked hand-in-hand -hand with dedicated ATF agents to make great cases that truly impacted the safety of the public. There was an absolute sense of teamwork and respect. Again, I'm going to emphasize the words teamwork and respect. Together with the prosecutors from the U.S. Attorney's offices with whom I'd worked, we'd used confidential informants, proffers, cooperation agreements, waivers of speedy presentment, investigative grand juries and grand jury subpoenas, and an abundance of other investigative tools to make successful cases as part of a team. I left the New York Field Division in March of 2007 to begin working in my current post of duty as a supervisor of the Phoenix One Field Office. Within weeks, I was surprised at what I had observed. In my opinion, in my professional opinion, dozens of firearms traffickers were given a pass by the United States Attorney's Office for the District of Arizona. Despite the existence and probable cause, in many cases, there were no indictments, no prosecutions, and criminals were allowed to walk free. In short, their office policies, in my opinion, helped pave a dangerous path. Fortunately, the same could not be said of the Arizona Attorney General's Office, state prosecutors, to which we agents were forced to turn for prosecution of firearms cases. Victor Varela and his associates, who trafficked 50 caliber rifles directly to Mexican drug cartels, one of which was used to, to kill a Mexican military commander, were successfully prosecuted by the Arizona Attorney General's Office. And this was after the case had been declined for federal prosecution by Assistant U.S. Attorney Embry Hurley due to what he referred to as corpus delecti issues. Mr. Varela sadly was released from prison last July because of the lesser, set, lesser sentencing guidelines uh, that apply in state court. But the alternative, no prosecution, in my eyes, was unacceptable. Another case, which involved a corrupt federal firearms licensee uh, who was supplying several firearms or trafficking organizations, uh, was declined by Mr. Hurley. This particular dealer in his post-arrest statement admitted that approximately 1,000 of his firearms were trafficked to Mexico. Over one half dozen of that dealer's firearms were located around the body of Arturo Beltran Leyva, the head of the Beltran Leyva cartel, went after his body after he was killed uh, in a gun battle with the Mexican Naval Infantry in Cuernavaca, Mexico. Due to the recalcitrance of the United States Attorney's Office, cases such as these were prevented, presented for prosecution to the Arizona, uh, Arizona Attorney General's Office, where the state laws carried significantly lesser penalties than they did under the federal statutes. And I believe that it's this situation uh, where in the U.S. Attorney's Office for the District of Arizona in Phoenix, particularly, declined most of our firearms cases was at least one factor which led to the debacle that's now known as Operation Fast and Furious. And now I'll fast forward to Operation Fast and Furious itself. ATF agents assigned to the Phoenix Field Division with the concurrence of their chain of command walked guns. ATF agents allowed weapons to be provided to individuals who they knew would traffic them to members of the Me Mexican drug trafficking organizations. They did so by failing to lawfully interdict the weapons, and they did so by encouraging federal firearms licensees to continue selling weapons in instances where they knew that no interdic interdiction efforts would be planned. When I, when I voiced surprise and concern with this tactic to ASAC George Gillette and SAC William Newell, my concerns were dismissed. SAC Newell referred to the case as groundbreaking and bragged that we were the only people in the country doing this. My other ASAC, Jim Needles, merely said, Pete, you know that if you or I run on the case, it wouldn't be getting run this week, getting run this way. This operation, which in my opinion endangered the American public, was orchestrated in conjunction with Assistant U.S. Attorney Emory Hurley, the same Assistant U.S. Attorney who prevented us from using some of the common and accepted law enforcement techniques utilized elsewhere in the United States. I've read documents that indicate that his boss, U.S. Attorney Dennis Burke, also agreed with the direction of this case. 
Allowing firearms to be trafficked to criminals is a dangerous and deadly strategy. The thought that the techniques used in the Fast and Furious investigation would result in taking down a cartel, given the toothless nature of the straw purchasing law and the lack of a strong firearms trafficking statute is, in my opinion, delusional. Based upon my conversations with agents who had assisted in this case, surveillance was often terminated on individuals far from the border, which means that while the case agent believed that these weapons were destined for Mexico, the possibility exists that they were trafficked with cartel drugs to other points within the United States of America. As a career law, law enforcement officer who's had the, to investigate the deaths of police officers, children, and others at the hands of armed criminals, I was and continue to be horrified, truly horrified. I believe that these firearms will continue to turn up at crime scenes on both sides of the border for years to come. In closing, I want members of the committee and all Americans to know that this is not how ATF agents conduct business. I'm very proud of some of the incredible work done by ATF agents around the country every day. ATF agents have given their lives in the performance of duty. On my last trip back to New York, sir, I had the privilege of being present for a homicide trial. Uh, in that same courthouse in the Southern District of New York, there were three other separate homicide trials going on, all from three separate ATF-initiated investigations. That's the type of work ATF agents do every day, and that's what I'd like the committee to keep in mind as well. Um, I thank you for your time, and again, my condolences to the Terry family. I thank you. I thank all of our witnesses. I'll now recognize myself for the first uh, round of questioning. Mrs. Terry, uh, I understand the U.S. Attorney in Arizona visited you in December. Could you tell us in your own words uh, what he had to say? Which um, attorney are you talking about? Uh, th this is the U.S. Attorney from Arizona that came to visit you in December. Was that, was that Dennis Burke? Yes, it was Mr. Burke. And, and what did he have to say to you? He was just um, trying to explain to us exactly what happened in a uh, roundabout way. We really n never got anything out of the visit that he did have. Now, if, if he didn't tell you at that time that uh, the firearms that killed your son came from this operation, when did you learn about Fast and Furious and its connection to your son's death? Most of it I heard is from the media. We haven't really got anything direct, phone calls or nothing from anybody. Well, hopefully today we'll, we'll bring you some better answers on that. Mr. Heyer, uh, I understand recently you received a call from the U.S. Attorney's Office in Arizona. Could you please tell us the uh, content of that call? Now, the U.S. Attorney, Dennis Burke, uh, has tried to keep us advised on the prosecu prosecution of the, uh, the individuals believed uh, to have a hand in, in Brian's death. Um, so I received a telephone call um, whenever a indictment was going to be uh, made uh, and also some, uh, some information uh, about few, where the, the investigation was going with respect to Brian's uh, uh, killers. Did he ever comment about your testimony here today? Uh, he did not. Okay. Uh, Mr. Dotson, uh, t just yesterday, the Justice Department said the following, and, and I'll make a supposition for the record that uh, it's, it's untimely and unseemly for this kind of thing to come out, but I'm going to ask you to answer in regards to something Justice put out in the New York Times. An unnamed law enforcement source said to the New York Times, they said, gun ownership was such an ingrained part of the culture in Arizona that it was difficult to tell straw purchasers from legal ones without blank, blank, blank. Did you have trouble discerning that? Was it so difficult because of the culture that, in fact, any of you didn't know who the straw purchasers were? Uh, no, sir, not at all. I mean, first of all, I would, I, I would question that unknown law enforcement source as to his background on these matters. Here we call it Washington spin. Yes, sir. <laughs> um, sir, I can tell you this. In, in my knowledge and experience, when I sat ground in Phoenix, or when I got to Phoenix, the briefing that I got initially and the 40-some the suspects that were identified right off the bat, or they had already had identified, um, those cases were made against those individuals, most of them, almost that day, if not all of them. 
Um, to identify a straw purchaser from a normal American citizen who just happens to reside in a state where gun culture is, uh, is so prominent, you're, perhaps if a one-on-one -on -one scenario existed or a one-time, but to have an individual purchase hundreds of firearms over the course of an investigation while we're watching him, there's make no mistake, he was a straw purchaser. So uh, I guess Agent Kyle said, I think you'd probably agree that when you see someone buy hundreds, dozens or hundreds and take them to a drop point uh, and even often uh, more information, it's pretty obvious they're a straw purchaser. You've made your case under, under any kind of normal prosecution, wouldn't you? Yes, sir, that's correct. Mr. Heyer, uh, you're a Secret Service agent. Uh, probably qualifies you as much as, as anyone that could be in this room to understand a question I'm going to ask you, but you're also a family member. To date, the straw purchasers that were part of the chain of weapons that led to uh, the murder of, of your cousin, they haven't been charged with that crime. They've been charged with they, whatever it's called, buy and lie, basically uh, signing a false affidavit that they were the actual buyer of a gun. Do you believe that uh, it is reasonable to be, to be including them in uh, their connection to the murder of, of Brian Terry? Congressman, again, uh, I'm here as uh, strictly family today and not as uh, a Secret Service agent. Well, then for Peter Fortella, Fortelli, you, uh, you've all mentioned about uh, the prosecutions that you see, including in New York. You buy a gun, you knowingly sell it to a third party, you've lied about it, it leads to the murder. Isn't that how you get connected to that trial in addition to the trigger puller? Yes, sir. It would be a sequence of events that you would normally put together through interviews and, and other techniques. So it's pretty unusual to have the murder, a high-profile murder of a Border Patrol agent, and you, not, you don't roll up everybody involved into the prosecution which is taking place practically today. Fairly, uh, in all fairness, sir, I, I don't know what steps the FBI has taken in their investigation because that information has not be re been relayed to, to me at, at any point. Well, Mrs. Terry, we're going to do everything we can to get full answers and full prosecution. We want whatever would be the greatest uh, relief that we can give you to let you know that this won't happen again. Thank you. Thank you. We now recognize the ranking member for his question. I want to thank all of you for being here today. And to the Terry family, we thank you for your sacrifice. To Mrs. Terry, you raised an angel. When the description was made by, when I listened to that poem, that poem said it all. And I want to say to the family, I understand your pain. And I promise you, we will not rest. And to the agents, we will not rest. We will not rest until every single person responsible for all of us, no matter where they are, are brought to justice. And you said it best, Mr. Hayer, in your statement. The last thing you said, you said it is now up to all of us to put honor first and to remain always faithful in the quest for justice. And you're absolutely right. And I promise you, we will not fail you. To the ATF officers, I thank you. As I said earlier, this has got to be very, very difficult. And I make another, I make a commitment to you. And it's what Senator Grassley said. And I want the word to go out, let it go forth, that we want absolutely no retaliation against you. You are simply standing up for what you believe in. You're simply carrying out your oath of office. You've simply been great Americans and continue to be, and we thank you. We thank you so very, very much. We thank you for your bravery. We thank you for what you're doing. One of the most troubling allegations we have heard during this investigation is that the ATF agents group seven were ordered to terminate surveillance and monitoring of suspected straw purchasers without seizing the firearms. Special Agent Costa, in your written testimony, you made this statement. 
On numerous occasions, the surveillance team followed straw purchasers to Phoenix area, uh, area firearms dealers and would observe the straw purchasers buy and then depart with numerous firearms in hand. On many of these occasions, the surveillance team would uh, then follow the straw purchasers either to a residence or public location or until the surveillance team was spotted by the straw purchasers. But the end result was always the same. The surveillance was terminated. So my question is pretty basic. Do you know why the surveillance was terminated? Was it a, do you think it was a resource problem or was it a, a strategy uh, type of thing? No, sir, we had plenty of resources. I believe it was a strategy. As I indicated later in my statement, I found out about the briefing papers. At the time this was going on, we had no idea why things were occurring. We were just told to fall in line and, and do what we were told. And you, and you stated that you raised those concerns with your group supervisor, Mr. was it Mr. Voth? Yes, sir, Mr. Mr. Dave Voth. And Special Agent Dotson, you participated in a, in a transcribed interview with the committee, and your account is quite similar. Uh, let me read uh, what you said from the transcript. You said sometimes we would follow them back to their house, sometimes to, you know, a different house or a business or to meet another vehicle in a parking lot, and then we would have to uh, come back uh, to head to another FFL because one of the other suspects, uh, they were buying 15 or 20 of his own. Special Agent Dotson, again, I'm, I'm trying to understand this. If you're following a suspected straw purchase and you started the gun store and you follow it to a house, why wouldn't you keep uh, following that, uh, that gun? Sir, that, that's the one question that I can't answer for you is the why. It made no sense to us either. It's just what we were ordered to do, and every time we questioned that order, um, you know, the, there was punitive action against those of us that did so. As to why we would let them go or just follow them in, tuck them in bed at home, and, you know, us leave for the night, I can't tell you the why, sir. Mm -hmm. I can't. That's what I'm hopefully that this committee can find out. Well, we're going we're gonna to find out. I understand that uh, there might be a new suspected, I, I understand there might be new suspected straw purchases happening back at the gun store, but if you keep leaving the guns you're following to start striking new ones, you know, that doesn't seem to work, and I guess that's what all of you all are saying. Did you also raise your concerns, those concerns with Mr. Uh, Voth, your, your supervisor, I guess it was? Oh, yes, sir, many times. Have either of you ever received a substantive uh, explanation as to why this operation would voluntarily terminate surveillance of suspected weapon, weapon traffickers. Anybody? Uh, sir, I, no. I, most of the time when asked or pressed for an answer to that question, um, it was relayed to me that they didn't have to explain anything to me. Um, I was to do as I was told. Uh, on times where I questioned that even further, our boss uh, would have an ASAC come down, we'd have a meeting, and he would, uh, explain to us in his way of how he was not obligated to explain it any further to us and we needed to follow orders. Well, I, I think we are missing a piece of the puzzle here and I think here we must do more. Um, it sounds like both of you uh, raised concerns with your supervisor and I don't want to reach any conclusions yet on this because I think we need to gather more information. I think it makes sense to talk to the supervisor and figure out what his answer to these allegations might be. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I yield back. Thank you. I, I'm assuming that you now join me in ensuring that all of the, uh, the other people above these gentlemen will be interviewed in a prompt fashion, including those here in Washington. Mr. Chairman, um, I not absolutely no doubt about it. And at the same time, I'm glad you asked that question because we want to make sure, as I said, we want to make every sure in the words of Mr. Heyer that everyone is brought to justice. Now, let me be abundantly clear since you asked the question. I want to make sure that there's no person, I don't care who they are, uh, whose trial is jeopardized, that is able to get away, to get uh, off of charges. I don't care how it's connected with this. I don't want their trials jeopardized. As an officer of the court and one who's practiced criminal law for many years, I'm, I'm very concerned about that. And so I think that we can reach a balance. I want, I, and I've urged the uh, Justice Department uh, to cooperate. They have expressed their concerns. But again, as I said before, and I promise this family, I promise you, I will do everything in my power. I will not rest until we bring everybody to justice. I thank the gentleman. We now recognize the gentleman from Oklahoma, Mr. Langford, for five minutes. Thank you, and thank all of you for being here. This has got to be a very difficult day, and not a day that you would ever hope to be testifying in front of a congressional uh, hearing 
uh, especially related to something like this. So we very much appreciate your time and uh, for being here as well. Um, Special Agent Dodson, let me, let me ask you a series of questions, and these will be for several agents. G give me your best guess, and it's going to be just a guess on this. How many weapons do we have in the United States or in Mexico that are out there that are a result of Fast and Furious that we do not know where they are? Well, sir, my, my best guess estimate at that is, and remembering that Fast and Furious was one case from one group in one field division. Um, is about 2,500 totally, or t in total, that we facilitated the sale of to these known straw purchasers. And I've heard numbers as, as many as 300 to 800 or so that we know to have been recovered. So outstanding, you're, you're looking in the ballpark of anywhere from 1,000 to 1,500, 1,800 guns still. What's your best guess on how many of those are in Mexico and how many of those are in the United States? Um, I'd say two to one, Mexico versus U.S. Okay. Were there any other mechanisms discussed to trace these weapons that you knew were being sold to straw purchasers other than just serial numbers? Any other way to be able to track them, trace them? Yes, sir. At all? How successful do you think that was? Um, I can tell you that after a trip to Radio Shack with ATF funds, I myself manufactured a GPS tracking device that would fit inside the handle of an AK variant rifle. Um, the problem with it was the limited battery life. Um, there was also attempts made through our tech departments and other tech departments to um, have GPS systems, a GPS system, wired into one AK variant rifle. And how was that received by supervisors? Well, it, actually, the one that went through our tech section was initiated by them. Great. Um, after my attempt to manufacture one, it didn't work out so well. Um, the one that we got from our tech site did actually work. and. Um, Although it achieved its purpose in the last time I believe anyone knew its whereabouts was about 50 miles south of the U.S.-Mexican border. Special Agent Casa, do you know of any other offices of ATF that are using this type of strategy? Not that I'm aware of, no, sir. Would you consider this a common practice that's being contemplated in any other, any other area? No, sir. I definitely hope not. But no, sir. Okay. Let, let me follow up on a statement that you made that is a very, very serious statement. You made the statement in your, opening, in your opening statement. It's a common practice for supervisors to retaliate on special agents who do not tow the company line. Yes, sir. That's a pretty serious statement. It's commonplace with, with an ATF, sir. Is that, is that unique to your area or is that unique to multiple areas, you think, of ATF? My experience, sir, is unique to multiple areas within ATF. I've, no, I've, I've known multiple dozens of agents that have been, um, that have been received punitive punishments, um, whether they were justified or not. Okay. Mr. Forcelli. Yes, sir. Do we have a perfect storm here of a U.S. attorney who is unwilling to prosecute federal gun laws and a group of supervisors in ATF that are promoting a program to release weapons here, that just two errors here, or is it your sense there is something coordinated that's going on? And I understand that's a guess at this point. Sir, it's my belief that what we have here is actually a colossal failure in leadership from within ATF, uh, within the chain of command involved in this case, within the United States Attorney's Office, and within DOJ uh, as to the individuals who are aware of this strategy. To walk a single gun is, in my opinion, an idiotic move. Uh, more families will suffer, like the Terrys and like Mr. Cummings, at the, at the hands of armed criminals. We weren't giving guns to people who were hunting bear. We were giving guns to people who were killing other humans. The assumption that all of these guns went to Mexico is apparently something that they believed in that group. Um, but your assumption is this was coordinated among all those individuals, that this plan would, would, would happen and it was going to be allowed to happen. It would be allowed to happen, and we would trace guns into Mexico, be able to identify a cartel and take them down. The problem that, that we have is that I know, based on what I've heard from agents and what I heard over the radio, is that surveillances were terminated often far from the border. Some of these guns could have been diverted with cartel drugs to New York, to Baltimore, to Oklahoma, to anywhere in the United States. This was an, a, a catastrophic disaster. Thank you. With that, I yield back my time. I thank the gentleman. We now recognize the, the gentlelady from New York, Mrs. McCarthy. 
Maloney, I'm sorry. Th thank you, uh, Mr. You're Chairman. You're both New York, but I know the difference. Right, right. And, and, and ranking member for calling this important uh, hearing. And I join my colleagues in expressing our condolences and support to the Terry family. And I thank all of the professionals in, in law enforcement for your, your work and your bravery. And I especially want to uh, welcome Special Agent Forselli, since uh, I used to have the honor of representing the beautiful Bronx of where you served. And I appreciate your statements in support of the AFT in New York in their fine work. I, I would uh, like to ask you, uh, Special Agent, Agent uh, Forselli, some of the specific uh, statements in your, in your testimony to try to get a better understanding of what evidence is necessary in order to get a conviction in these cases. And if I understand this correctly, there is no federal statute that specifically prohibits straw purchases. Is that correct? No, ma'am. There, there is a statute, but the statute doesn't carry significant jail time. And, and candidly, I mean, I had great success working with Pre Barara and several administrations before his with the U.S. Attorney's Office in New York. And we used basic techniques. You, you arrest the people who are we, the bottom feeders, the lower people in an organization, and then you proffer them. You gather information. You utilize uh, waivers of speedy presentment where you have somebody go do a delivery in the street to catch the next guy in the, in the chain, have the, the, the straw buyer perhaps deliver the firearms to the trafficker and then arrest the trafficker. Um, we didn't have those tools available to us in, in Arizona because the United States Attorney's Office wouldn't allow us to utilize waivers of speedy presentment before a magistrate. Proffers almost never happened. The basic investigative techniques that I used with great success in Southern District of New York, Eastern District of New York, and elsewhere uh, weren't being deployed in the District of Arizona. Well, Working with my staff, when we looked into it, uh, straw purchases are typically charged under Section 922 and 924 of the Criminal Code, and these sections make it a crime to knowingly make a false statement. And in this case, the false statement would be when a straw purchaser lies on a Form 4473 when he or she makes a straw purchase. This was the way that they went after straw purchases in other states. Are you aware with this of, of these two sections and knowingly making a, a false statement? Are you aware of that particular? I am, ma'am. Okay. Uh, and again, I'll just state Say that um, in many instances, these cases weren't prosecuted by the U.S. Attorney's Office. But I, I want to get back to, to the false statement. And, and what is the false statement they would make on such a form that they could use in prosecutions? Are you aware? It, it, well, the, the most blatant one is that there's a box that you check whether or not you're purchasing the firearm for yourself. A straw purchaser clearly is not. They're okay. buying that gun merely to deliver it to another person. Uh, the other lies would be sometimes people put false addresses. And, and getting back to your statement on, on the prosecutions, uh, border state U.S. attorneys have complained that district court judges view these prosecutions as mere paper violations. And have you heard this criticism before? I have, and I agree with it. Uh, I think perhaps a mandatory minimum one-year sentence might deter an individual from buying a gun. Some people view this as no more consequential than doing 65 yeah. and a 55. And, and the Justice uh, Department. If the, gentleman, if the gentlelady will suspend, I want to caution the witnesses that the scope of this, your, your testimony here, is limited and that is not about proposed legislation and the like, and under our House rules would not fall within the scope of this. So well, anecdotally, you can have opinions, but ultimately it would not be considered valid testimony. Uh, yes, well, point of order, I, Mr. Chairman. Are, are these state, the gentleman will state his point of order. Yes. Um, uh, let me just, the officer for Sully in his, um, in his testimony has a statement, Mr. Chairman, that I read where he says that these firearms are ending up on both sides of the border. And I think it's only fair that since it's his statement that she, in this, and that's basically what she's pretty the, much going to, but. The gentlelady uh, can, can ask any question she wants within the scope of the hearing. Under Rule 11, Clause 2K8, it's the discretion of the committee as to the, the breadth of the, of the testimony. Any question related to the operations or the failures of Fast and Furious or factual indications of what occurred in Arizona or throughout the system are within the scope of the hearing, proposed legislation at a federal level, and whether or not 
uh, they should be changed or outside the scope of not only this hearing, but would not ordinarily fall under the jurisdiction of this committee. The Just to may continue. further, further point, uh, Board of Order, Mr. Chairman, it's my understanding of the rules is that you can, you can object to the question, but you can't tell the witness what to testify to. Well, reclaiming my time, I, I appreciate the chairman's statement, and I appreciate your statement earlier when you said you wanted full answers and full prosecution. And I think it's certainly within the scope of this hearing to understand why we're not getting a full prosecution. And the allegation that they call them paper excuses as opposed to a, a valid uh, concrete way to react, I think, is a, a valid way to go forward. The gentlelady's I am, I'm supporting the, the, your statements. The gentlelady, if she would suspend for just a moment, the gentlelady's questions and whether or not the gentleman believes that law enforcement was doing its job or that the courts were properly enforcing and whether that may have led to actions is fully within the scope. Anything that these individuals witnessed in or around Fast and Furious is certainly within the scope. I only caution, we're not here to talk about proposed gun legislation. It would be outside the scope of this hearing. Well, I, I wasn't discussing that. I, I was trying to figure out why the Justice Department and the IG found that prosecutors often decline these gun cases. I want to know why they're declining them. And, and to quote uh, from the, the testimony, some, one of you said, because they believe it is difficult to obtain convictions on these violations and because they believe it is difficult to obtain paperwork from Mexico. And, and my question is, are these valid excuses not to bring these cases? I think that's a valid question to get to why we're not getting prosecutions in these cases. Are these valid excuses to say they're paper excuses uh, not to bring it? I believe not, ma'am. And, and again, uh, to go after the mid-level and upper-level members of a cartel, you need to start, uh, unless you have evidence on them immediately, mm -hmm. with the, the people at the bottom of the food chain. Um, okay. when, when straw buyer cases are dismissed because of excuses made up by the United States Attorney's Office, uh, as opposed to when you have factual evidence that shows that person's committed a crime, then you can't prosecute that, that bottom feeder to move up to the next level. One of you in your testimonies called these uh, laws uh, to prosecute toothless. And could you explain to me why are existing straw purchase laws toothless? My opinion, ma'am, is that with these types of cases, for somebody to testify against members of a cartel, where the alternative is seeing a probation officer once a month, they're going to opt towards, you know, not cooperating with the law enforcement authorities. And what would help your interactions with the U.S. Attorney's Office, I, I, Mr. Casa, uh, Mr. Forcelli, or others? Uh, what, what would help you be able to be part of getting convictions and bringing those uh, to justice uh, as, as that are part of these straw purchases that led to the death of, of Mrs. Terry's son? The, the gentlelady's time has expired. You certainly can answer that. Well, I believe first and foremost, they, they probably need more resources at the U.S. Attorney's Office in Arizona. The, the over, there are an overwhelming numbers of, of gun crimes occurring there, uh, and if they don't have the resources to prosecute them, then I would imagine that they would need some assistance in those regards. We now recognize the gentleman from Idaho, Mr. Labrador, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Terry family, thank you for being here. Um, I, I will always remember uh, the poem, and I think I'm going to put this on my wall. I do not fear death, but I do fear the loss of my honor. I think that's something that hopefully every member of Congress can some, somehow remember. I think sometimes we worry too much about death, and in our case, death is you know the next election. Um, and too many of us forget that what we should be worried about is our honor and the honor of this nation. So thank you, Ms. Ms. Terry, for raising such a great son. Uh, I have five children, and I cannot even imagine what, what you're going through. Um, when did you, Ms. Terry, when, when did you first hear that, um, you, you, I think you, you said you first heard about the weapons being purchased through the um, Operation Fast and Furious. You heard that through the media, or did you hear that from, from uh, any of the agencies? No. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, mostly on TV, the media, newspapers. I never really got a call about anything like that until it was brought out in the newspapers. And how did you feel when when you heard about that? I I was I just was flabbergasted. I just I didn't believe it at first. Um, 
did you have any questions? Did any questions come to your mind when you started learning that maybe there was something? Because I, I think I heard about this when I was first elected. I'm a freshman here, and I was just first elected. And right after my election, I started hearing from people in my district about this. And we, in fact, were some of the first to call for a hearing here in, in uh, Congress about this and in, in the House. And what went through your mind? What, what were some of the thoughts that you had? Well, I did ask a lot about um, how it happened, when it happened, why it happened, but never got no answers because nobody wanted to say anything. So did you ask, address these questions with the Department of Justice or any members of the Attorney oh, General? Yes, yes. And no one is, has answered those questions? We got a lot of different answers. Okay. To, to whom did you speak specifically? Do you remember? Well, we've been to so many memorials, and I've talked to so many people. <laughs> but um, I talked to a lot of his Bortec friends that were that were on the um, unit that was with him, and they were like on a gag order, so they couldn't tell us nothing. They was like they didn't even want to talk to us. Are you satisfied with the answers you're getting? No. No. A any of the members of the family, are you satisfied with the answers you're getting? Mr. Heyer. I think I can speak for the family, Congressman, that uh, there is a, a level of frustration for the family. Um, I want to make it clear that our number one goal is to pursue the prosecution of all the killers of Brian. That's our number one goal. And, uh, you know, the U.S. Attorney's Office uh, in Tucson and the FBI is working very hard to do that. But I also think that I can speak for the family. We've talked about this this morning. That there seems to be a separation, a distinct separation between Brian's murder investigation and the ATF Operation Gunrunner Fast and Furious operation. Um, there seems to be a hesitancy to connect the two. So that part is very frustrating. Um, Can you tell me, Special Agent Casa, do you, do you, or any of, of the special agents, that, that's a great point. Why do you think there's a, this separation? Why are they making this separation between the murder of the agent and, and the Operation Gunrunner? Simply put, just to, to reduce their liability in, 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 in our ATF's role in this murder. Started with the straw purchase that wasn't interdicted and ends up in the murder of, of a law enforcement officer, an honor, by the sounds of a very honorable law enforcement officer. Thank you. I, I have no further questions. Would the gentleman yield? Absolutely. Well, following up on that. The two serial numbers that were, you, that were used and found at the scene, to your knowledge, aren't those serial numbers not the first, the second, or the third purchases, meaning there already was a case made against a potential defendant and that could have been arrested and even turned as an informant potentially prior to the sale of those two weapons? My understanding is yes. Thank you. We now recognize the gentleman from Massachusetts, Mr. Lynch. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, first of all, Mrs. Terry and, and Mr. Heyer, uh, my prayers and condolences go to your, your son, your cousin, and your family. Uh, Spe Special Agent Forcelli, uh, in your statement you expressed extreme frustration with the U.S. Attorney's Office in Phoenix. Uh, you said they, they gave uh, dozens of firearms traffickers a pass. You also testified that they allowed criminals to walk free, and you, you indicated that they declined most of the cases most of your cases, and this was at least one factor which led to the debacle and perhaps the necessity of Operation Fast and Furious. Is that correct? Yes, sir. I strongly believe that. Those are very strong allegations, so I want to ask you about the specific cases that you, you cite. Uh, first, you talked about the 2007 case of Victor Varela, who uh, trafficked, uh, I think, 50 caliber rifles to the Mexican drug cartels, one of which was used to kill a Mexican military commander. Uh, the U.S. Marshal David Gonzalez said at the time, this, this case was made one of our highest priorities because of the nature of the crime. 
but you say that the assistant U.S. attorney in Phoenix wouldn't prosecute. Uh, do you believe in that case that we had sufficient evidence uh, to move forward with the prosecution? Absolutely. In fact, sir, the, that case was prosecuted by the Arizona Attorney General's Office, where they had to utilize statutes that aren't normally u utilized in gun cases. They had to charge them with fraud schemes for falsifying the Form 4473s. Um, Mr. Hurley, the assistant U.S. attorney who declined the case, stated that because the gun was in Mexico, the body of the crime was in Mexico, we have no case, and, right. and just outright declined prosecution for that reason. Um, we had identified additional straw buyers in Mr. Varela's network. We had gotten cooperating statements from them. They also went to jail. Uh, this could have been a very good federal case, but Again, the U.S. Attorney's Office declined it because, in their opinion, the gun being in Mexico meant that the evidence of the crime was in Mexico. Do you know any other uh, uh, office or region that applies that type of standard uh, to go forward with prosecutions? Sir, my, I was told this was a Ninth Circuit issue, but I've had discussions with prosecutors in Los Angeles, which is also in the Ninth Circuit, that say that they didn't carry it to that extreme. And, and what I will say for the record, sir, is since then, uh, since Mr. Hurley is no longer running the firearms unit, he's been replaced or, or now answers to another supervisor, they've now amended that to, to say that if we can go down and physically examine the weapon or have one of our assets in Mexico examine the weapon, that they will now charge those crimes. But for, for two years where I was in charge of the firearms trafficking unit, if the gun went to Mexico, that case was dead. Okay. Uh, you also uh, testified regarding the Excalibur uh, gun store case in 2008. You said the dealer in that case admitted that about 1,000 firearms were, were trafficked to Mexico, and half a dozen of them were found around the dead body of car cartel leader Beltran Leva, who was killed by the Mexican Naval Industry Infantry. Is that correct? Yes, sir. For the record, though, I'd like to point sure. out that that case was brought to trial by the Arizona Attorney General's office. However, the, uh, the gun dealer, uh, the case was dismissed by the judge. Right. So uh, I, that case was dismissed. Yeah. However, well, I, what I will say, so uh, in, in regards to that case, is I did, after that case was declined by the United States Attorney's Office, present that case to the Southern District of New York for prosecution because they were doing a lot of international narcotics trafficking cases. And that office had told me if we could have shown one wire transfer, one banking transaction through their district, they would have been interested in taking that case. Meanwhile, in the state where all these crimes took place, they were readily willing to just dismiss prosecution efforts. Right. But the, both the Washington Post and, and PBS uh, Frontline uh, support your, your version, I guess, uh, concluded that if there were ever a good case against a set of rogue gu gun traffickers, the case against the owner of Excalibur Gun Store was it. And I'll read from the uh, excerpt from Washington Post here. It says, this was a case that seemingly had everything in its favor. In this, in this case, the agents had tons of evidence, surveillance, recorded phone calls, confidential informants and undercover agents posing as straw buyers. But this case was also denied, as you say, by the uh, assistant U.S. attorney in Phoenix. Is that correct? Yes, sir. The same assistant U.S. attorney who was the prosecutor in the Fast and Furious investigation, as a matter of fact. Okay. And then in 2009, 2010, you all, I'm running out of time, uh, you also say the same assistant U.S. attorney declined dozens of other cases. Is that correct? After 2009, sir, my duties were changed to a home invasion investigation, so I'm not certain what happened with the uh, firearms trafficking okay. investigation. What's your assessment of why this specific U.S. attorney repeatedly refused to take a gun case? Do you have any? Sir, I, I, I don't know. Um, I, I couldn't give you a reason as to why. Okay, maybe we should have him in for questioning. But that'd be great. All right. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I've run out of time. Would the gentleman like an additional 30 seconds? Uh, please. Yeah, that'd be you're, great. Thank oh, you. Without objection. Um, I, I just want to note that you, your testimony, which is very good, and, and, and look, it takes a lot of courage to do what you gentlemen are doing. It goes back to 2007. It does. Uh, so, you know, this isn't a political issue because obviously, you know, we're talking about career prosecutors who have been there since the Bush administration, and you cite, as you cite, going back to 2007, you're not alone in your assessment. Uh, we've heard other complaints from other witnesses. Uh, so I, I just want to thank you for your, your willingness to come forward and help the committee with its work. I want to thank the chairman for the extra 30 seconds. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Uh, thank the gentleman. We now recognize the gentleman from Utah, Mr. Chaffetz, for five minutes. Thank you. Uh, first to the Terry family, uh, thank you for your, your, uh, your son's service, your, your relative's service. Um, he's a hero. You know, you got a lot of people on the front line doing tough things. And uh, there'll be uh, nights ahead. I, I just want to know and express, given an opportunity, 
know how much uh, we appreciate his service and, and we'll remember him. Uh, and to the agents who are brave enough to step forward and tell it like it is, we thank you. It takes a lot of bravery to step forward and, and do the right thing. And I, I know you probably had sleepless nights and, and, and we'll have some others uh, moving forward, but you're doing the right thing. And we want to thank you f uh, for your service and for your bravery and, and sharing your, your personal perspective uh, in this situation. Um, Mr. Dodson, I, let's start with you for a second. What, at what point did you come to the, where you just, you had to come forward, you had to actually say something? Because usually these things kind of build up or something big happens. Explain to me what happened to where you thought enough is enough. Do, do you mean outside of ATF, sir, or, or? In this particular case, I mean, why did you get to this point where you're sharing this information? Well, I questioned my supervisors almost immediately once we realized, you know, once we had relocated to Phoenix and uh, got briefed in and, and then actually started operationally that we were allowing all these guns to go. Um, then as, my, as the case agent, my supervisor, and ultimately my chain of command had all informed me that I was wrong and, and they were right and this was, you know, a righteous operation, it, it wasn't until um, December 15th, 2010, um, when I read, well, we have a SIR report, a significant incident report, detailing um, ATF's preliminary investigation into the trace and weapons purchased by Jaime Avila. And after reading that and then speaking with my FBI counterparts and learning that they were unaware of all of the events surrounding the purchase and trace of those firearms is when I had to go outside of ATF. And I attempted to contact originally our uh, chief counsel's office, our ethics section, um, I made several attempts to contact the OIG's office, and uh, ultimately I was able to speak to someone at Senator Grassley's office. Do you think that there is a conflict between the OIG, uh, given that maybe this started as a result of a recommendation, or do you see any sort of conflict that the investigator general has in this case? Well, I, I can see a conflict between the office of the OIG, yes, sir, the actual individuals that are working the case. My interaction with them since I've been interviewed by them is that I, I think they get it. Um, however, those two offices, being what they are and how they are aligned, it's, there's inherently a conflict of interest there. If, in fact, someone at DOJ authorized this, is, knows about it, is as well versed in it as everyone at ATF, um, that thereby creates the conflict with OIG. Give me an idea of the size and scope. I mean, we're talking about thousands of guns knowingly going uh, south, so to speak. In your normal course of business, if you thought that there was a straw purchase happening, how many guns would kind of push you over the threshold to say, we better stop that? Well, sir, I can tell you this. Prior to my arriving in Phoenix in December 2009, my entire career we have never walked a firearm. And as a matter of fact, even if one had gotten away from us, if it was only a prop which had been mechanically engineered so that it could not effectively fire around, even if that got away from us, no one went home until we got it back. Even just one gun? Yes, sir. And in this case, we have thousands of guns. Now, what, what, was, what, was the over, what was the goal here? I mean, sir, I, I can tell you what I was told. I was told that the goal is to ultimately target and bring an entire cartel to prosecution. But how were they going to do that? I mean, the, car the suspected cartels were in Mexico, were they not? Yes, sir, they were. And I have no idea how they planned to do that by this operation or, or how it was designed to function. So what, was it the goal to knowingly and intentionally allow these guns to go into Mexico? As, was that the ultimate goal? Not as explained to me. Was that part of, was that the rules in play to achieve what the goal that they had explained? Yes. We were mandated, let these guns go. Make no mistake, there was not a time we were out there on surveillance where we didn't have the forethought that these were going to be recovered in crimes. The next time we became aware of these guns would be when they were recovered at their final crime. Not whatever crime they might have done. It was the last crime that they commit, that they're, not they commit, but the person who has them commit, that they're recovered in. There may be nine or ten that the cartels have perpetrated with those firearms prior to that date, but that recovery date is when we'll learn about it. So ultimately what was the main goal as explained to me, was to get a cartel. The mission, what we were doing, what we were ordered to do every day, was watch these, the same guys, buy the same guns from the same dealers who we told to make the sales, 
and then we'd sit back and wait for the traces. And when they came through from places in Mexico where it was definitively related to cartels, they were giddy. They thought that that justified, that, that, that created their nexus from this straw purchaser to the cartel. However, there's not a rookie police officer in this country that can explain to you how we're going to make a case on them with that information. My time has expired. Yield back. I thank the gentleman. We now yield uh, five minutes to the gentleman from Virginia, Mr. Connolly. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And uh, let me first join my colleagues in expressing my profound sympathy to the Terry family uh, for your your loss and the country's loss. And it, it maybe sounds hollow to say thank you for his service. Uh, we're in a terrible battle in the southwest of our country and on the border with Mexico and in northern Mexico. Um, sadly, he is another victim of that terrible battle, but um, his memory and his contribution are something that will long be remembered and appreciated, and our thoughts and prayers go out to you and the family. I want to thank our three agents for being here, uh, for your courage and for your testimony. Um, I want to uh, respectfully uh, suggest, however, that uh, I think that uh, you know, we, we urged you to speak freely at, at some risk, and that means answering questions freely without interference from any other member of this committee. Um, and uh, we don't censor content here. Uh, the hearing has a scope, but if you feel an answer to a question requires amplification, you don't need to be mindful of the scope and an individual member of this committee has an individual right to ask questions and to solicit answers without censorship. So I want you to have that confidence just as we began this hearing, urging you to speak freely. So you can speak freely in answering questions, including questions put by this member. Um, let me, let me uh, ask you, uh, Special Agent Vaselli, uh, I read your testimony about the U.S. Attorney in, in Phoenix, and I want to explore with you just a little bit. To what do you attribute the seeming reluctance to prosecute aggressively obvious illegal behavior that has a direct impact on your mission and that of the U.S. Attorney's Office. Sir, I, I can't say for sure. And, and again, I don't want to paint the entire United States Attorney's Office with a broad brush. Um, we had a very successful program that took place two summers ago where we arrested 70 home invaders, violent criminals who were doing drug robberies and, and prosecuted them, went to trial. For some reason, uh, the firearms unit, which was at first when I arrived in Phoenix, was run by Rachel Hernandez and then subsequently run by Emery Hurley, consistently had issues with prosecuting our cases. Uh, one example, we had, we had an informant that they dismissed outright. Um, this informant had provided truthful testimony, had provided accurate information, everything that met all the standards that we look for in law enforcement. Uh, they dismissed every case that this informant had anything to do with. Uh, so when I questioned him as to why, we, why are we no longer using this informant, they said that his information was inaccurate and he lied. Well, I was upset because I had such a good relationship with the prosecutors in New York that my agents would bring a substandard product to the U.S. Attorney's Office. So I went back and questioned him and looked at the documents and that informant's information was dead on. I then re-engaged Ms. Hernandez and asked why are we not using this informant and she stated, well, he was moved with EWAP funds, Emergency Witness Assistant Program funds, and DOJ policy says we can't do that. Well, having worked with the Southern District of New York and having contacted Maine Justice, I found out that that wasn't true. The only disclosure would be at trial, you may have to articulate that that informant was paid those funds. When I approached her again about this particular situation, because dozens of cases hung in the balance, she, she finally conceded, well, he wore a lot of jewelry, he doesn't have jury appeal, my final answer is no, we won't use him. I know I've used murderers, I've used robbers, I've used all sorts of people to put on the witness stand to make cases as part of cooperation agreements. Part of a lawyer's job is to prep a witness. If this guy wore too much gold chain or didn't have jury appeal, it's incumbent on the prosecutor to help get him ready for testimony. So I found that it was either laziness or arrogance that, that really terminated many of our cases. And when you compare that experience to your experience in New York, this was unusual? Sir, I can say that uh, I worked at the United States Attorney's Office mostly for the Southern District through Mary Jo White's tenure there, through Dave, uh, Dave Kelly, James Comey, uh, even currently uh, with Preet Bharara, consistently outstanding. I can tell you that in the United States Attorney's Office from Arizona, when I got there, uh, Daniel Knauss was acting because the U.S. Attorney had been fired. 
It was bad doing gun cases. And, 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 it, and it continued to be. It has improved slightly since this flare-up, but it's been consistently bad. Thank you. Um, one final question. I wish I had more time, um, but we talked about resources. There are 8,500 licensed gun dealers in the four southwestern states. Yes, You've got 224 ATF agents assigned to Project Gunrunner. Do you really have the resources you need to do your job? It's amazing, sir, that you asked me that because I just had contact last week with a friend of mine who works in the 46th precinct where I worked as a, as a New York City police officer. It's one square mile. There are 355 police officers assigned to the 46th precinct, one square mile. I have less than 100 agents assigned to the entire state of Arizona. That's 114,006 square miles. So do we have the resources? No, we don't. We, we desperately need them. Does that justify us not stopping no, no. the car? No. Different no. issue. Thank you, Special Agent. Thank you. We now go to the gentleman from South Carolina, Mr. Gowdy, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you for uh, your leadership on this issue. Uh, and to the uh, family of Agent Terry, uh, let me say on behalf of the people from the upstate of South Carolina, we offer our condolences and we thank you for the service and ultimately the sacrifice of your son, your brother, your friend. Uh, to ATF, um, I worked with ATF for 16 years, and I find this hearing to be bitterly disappointing. This is not reflective of the ATF agents that I worked with for 16 years. Um, and this panel is perhaps not the best panel for me to express my displeasure. Uh, but nonetheless, uh, let me ask you this. When did ATF have either constructive or actual knowledge that guns were going to Mexico? Sir, it's my understanding that in 2009, when Operation Fast and Furious it was initiated, they were not interdicting firearms, and they had knowledge that those guns were being trafficked to Mexico. And when you say interdicting firearms, you mean something as simple as a traffic stop several miles away from where uh, the purchase was made, pretextual if it need be, but a traffic stop so you don't blow your informant. That easily could have been done, right? Absolutely. In fact, let me point out something, sir. A lot of the, we say an informant, a lot of the information that came into ATF came in from gun dealers who didn't like the fact that they're portrayed as this nefarious right. gray market. The gun dealers were our friends. They helped us make a lot of these cases, and, and we had some successful cases, and this is an anomaly, this, this Fast and Furious investigation. But the problem is then by getting them mixed up in this thing and encouraging, to sell, encouraging them to sell guns when they decided to stop, did not help our reputation with the gun industry. The other thing is if our job is to stem the flow of firearms into Mexico and certain gun dealers realize there's a straw purchasing problem and they're willing to, forgive me for using a, a, an analogy, turn off the faucets, well, we could have diverted our assets elsewhere and looked at other gun dealers where we thought that the straw purchasers were going to. Instead, but, we, can, we just encourage them to continue selling guns. It made no sense. But even for this investigation, um, as, as half-baked as it was, to ever have worked you would have had to have extradited uh, folks from Mexico uh, back for prosecution in a lying and buying case with a statutory maximum of what, 10 years? And the guidelines of, uh, what are the guidelines in a typical lying and buying case? Generally speaking, people with no, well, because they don't have criminal history, which is why they can fill out the form, they get probation. But again, that's if they're prosecuted at all. They, they, they could have done car stops. They could have done search warrants. They already had a Title III up, from what I understand, correct? Yes. All right. So uh, I, I, even if it had worked, I don't understand how it ever would have worked. Well, sir, let, let's say, for example, that we wouldn't get as far as to be able to extradite the heads of the cartel. Perhaps by going out there doing interdictions, we could have deterred some of these guns from being purchased. Secondly, had we been able to go out there and, and, and stop a straw buyer and then perhaps go do a controlled delivery, we, we would have made it up to the next level in New York. You could have flipped them, though. You, would not, you don't have to let the guns walk. Flip them. Absolutely. H how does your U.S. attorney not do proffers? That shocks me, sir. Would they do them very sparingly. Seventy home invasion defendants we arrested, as I pointed out earlier. We proffered one. We could have solved rob unsolved robberies. We could have solved unsolved homicides. We could have solved an untold number of crimes had we had access to those defendants. Now, this was an OSADEF case, right? Uh, the yes, sir. Yes, sir. Fast and Furious was an OSADEF case. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. What other federal agencies were involved, and, and what complaints did they lodge? Well, sir, I can tell you from almost the genesis of the case, we had uh, an agent with Immigration and Customs Enforcement embedded in Group 7. 
um, acting on a co case agent status. So ICE was well aware of it. Um, was the and, Bureau involved? I'm sorry? The Bureau? Well, FBI? You've got to understand, F, or, uh, ATF Group 7 is the Phoenix Strike Force Group. The, the DOJ Strike Force consists of entities from DEA, um, FBI, ATF, and ICE. What, what I'm trying to get a sense of, and I've, only, I've got less than a minute, I want to know how many different law enforcement officers and agencies told the United States Attorney's Office this is a dreadful idea. How many different people and agencies said this is unprecedented, it is a dreadful law enforcement idea, and it needs to stop? How many people told Ms. McAllister and Ms. English this is a horrible idea? As for agencies that expressed that to the U.S. Attorney's Office, there are none that I am aware of. As for individuals that expressed it to Ms. McAllister, myself, many. Special oh. Agent Casa, uh, Special Agent Alt, Special Agent Medina voiced his concern. So countless detailees that came through? Yes. Almost every person that came through that group, that's every, how it was going on. Every agent from outside of the Phoenix Field Division, sir, as well as many in it, but specifically those that came in from the outside, we're appalled as soon as they learn. Shocked well, and appalled. I, I, I'm out of time, but, but, but I would like to ask one more question. When the supervisors realized that guns were making it into Mexico, acknowledging the fact that we uh, do not have much success extraditing people from Mexico for lying and buying cases, where the Mexican authorities warned, hey, something uh, bad has happened and firearms are in your country because we turned an eye to it. Sir, Sir I can say, having had conversations with our, our staff in Mexico City, this is ATF personnel assigned to Mexico City, that they were not fully briefed on this. Uh, they're very upset about it. Um, this is something that was contained within the, the ATF Group 7. So we're going to ask for extradition cooperation from a country that doesn't even know what we're doing, Sir, that doesn't even know that we're letting guns go into their country that murders their citizens as well as our agents. No, no sir, because actually the way this case is designed, we don't even have a lying and buying charge on the individual that committed the crime in Mexico with these firearms. They're not the ones that lied on the form. The no, you'd have to have a conspiracy case, which I'm sorry, which I'm, we I'm never Which we never took the steps to develop that conspiracy, sir. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And I thank the gentleman. We now recognize the gentleman from Massachusetts, Mr. Tierney. Thank you very much. And uh, my condolences to the family as well and, and friends on that. And I'm not going to be asking you any questions, but I don't want you to interpret that as being unmindful of your pain and, and your sacrifice on that. Uh, I hope you accept it as such. But I would like to talk to the, uh, the three special agents on this a little bit and go back. First of all, I, I do suspect that the Mexican uh, government understands that uh, there are guns coming from the United States into Mexico. I mean, Mexico's ambassador Arturo uh, Suricán has stated pretty clearly that he thinks guns from the United States have been feeding violence and overwhelming firepower uh, is being unleashed by drug traffickers. So I think they're quite aware of that. But before this Fast and Furious became the policy that we're all seriously questioning now, uh, was it the uh, Project um, Gun Runner? Was that the the policy of the uh, government from 2006 to 2009? Sir, if I, if I may, Project yeah. Gunrunner it was a funding source that led to staffing many groups uh, along southwest border uh, it, you know, offices with, with agents. Um, Project Gunrunner was preceded by something that they referred to as Operation Southbound. And what, what that did was we identified straw buyers uh, through the cooperation of gun dealers or through uh, reviewing documents of past firearms purchases, and then we would go out and do car stops and do interdictions. In many, in many of those interdictions, there were no prosecutions for the reasons I stated earlier, uh, but the point was that we lawfully seized the weapons based on probable cause, and those weapons wouldn't hurt anybody. Now, there were plenty of times where if a gun dealer was suspicious of a person and we would stop them and that person was a law-abiding citizen, they went on their way with their lawfully purchased firearm and, and, and our apology. But if they were criminals, those guns were in our custody, whether they went to jail or not, and they never hurt a soul. Were there any appreciable amount of weapons, you think, getting through that system, still making it to Mexico? Absolutely. And it's, it's the nature of the, the straw purchasing. I mean, a straw purchaser is somebody who is legitimate. If the gun dealer isn't suspicious and he makes that sale and then that person then hands it off to somebody who's going to bring it down to Mexico, we're going to have no way of knowing that until the gun is recovered in, in Mexico. So, in fact, you're familiar with the uh, Ignatosian case? I was the supervisor of that investigation, sir. Well, I assume you were unhappy with that result. Extremely. Uh, and in that case, didn't a judge make a determination that um, essentially he threw the case out after about eight days of trial 
uh, on the premise that uh, there was no proof that the ultimate uh, person that got that gun was an, a person not allowed or not lawfully in possession. Correct. What he was stating was that we couldn't prove that he was supplying prohibited persons. That wasn't the allegation or the nature of the case. Um, and again, that's why after that happened, I tried to present this case to the United States Attorney's Office in New York, which is just incredible at the way narcotics cases. And had we had one wire transfer or one banking transaction occur in that district, I'm, I'm convinced we would have had a successful prosecution there. Do you think there's any hesitation on federal prosecutors? I ask this of all of you agents because you've been so candid. Any hesitation on the part of federal prosecutors because they think somehow pursuing these cases is going to be interpreted as violating or looking to violate somebody's Second Amendment rights? No, sir. I, I honestly don't think so from my perspective. Having That's not what causes the inertia on the, on the part of the uh, prosecutors? I, I can't say for sure, sir. I, I would have to agree with Pete Purcelli that no. So if a person goes into a, um, a store, a gun store, and buys... Uh, two or three or four handguns, does federal law require them to uh, report that? Yes, sir. Okay. And if I were a person who went into a, uh, a store and I bought four or five long guns? No such requirement, sir. So what if I went in and uh, you're familiar with the, uh, the Romanian AKs? Yes. All right. it, and it's fair to say that there's a, a high amount or large proportion of the guns that are going to Mexico uh, constitute the AKs, uh, the Romanian AKs? Absolutely. All right, so they're coming from Romania or to this country, they get docked it up and changed, and then they move on down to Mexico? Yes, sir. All right. So if I went into a store and bought any number of those, the store owner doesn't have to report that? No. All right. If I was reported to you, would that give you some indication that here's something you ought to investigate? Sir, it's my opinion. Just like we, we monitor monies wired to the Middle East, and we, we monitor how much Sudafed somebody buys in a pharmacy nowadays because right. that's what's utilized to make methamphetamine. It would be similar to that. Not everybody who buys more than one gun is a criminal, but it would give us an indicator that, hey, why is this person buying seven AKs? Maybe that's somebody we want to speak to. Right. Now we're not aware of those multiple sales unless one of two things happens. A is the, we have a cooperative gun dealer who calls us and says, hey, something's not right here. Or B, that weapon is, one of those weapons is, is found at a, at a crime scene and traced back to that individual. And then we go pull the paperwork manually from the gun dealer. Is there any law enforcement reason or rationale that you can think of uh, why we would not want to have that information reported? Multiple sales of long arms like uh, Romanian AKs or something? I can only give you my personal opinion, sir. It would be a good indicator for us, a good starting point, much like it is with handguns. But no reason that you can think of why you wouldn't want to have it reported. It wouldn't interfere with uh, law enforcement efforts if it was reported. In my opinion, it would help our efforts, sir. Okay. Thank you. The gentleman's time has expired. The gentleman from Texas, Mr. Farenthold, is recognized for five minutes. Thank you. Um, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I, too, would like to express my condolences to the Terry family. The district I represent includes Brownsville, where the family of uh, Special Agent Jaime Zapata uh, reside as well, and they're going through... Uh, some pain similar to what uh, you guys are going through, uh, very possibly as a result of uh, ill-conceived uh, policies uh, by the uh, ATF. Um, I, I did have a couple of questions for the uh, for, for the gentleman here uh, from from the agency, and uh, we appreciate your courage in uh, testifying, and uh, want to assure you that uh, I think I speak for the bulk of this committee that. Uh, we, we really appreciate your uh, courage in coming out. We would certainly uh, be a bad thing if there were to be any repercussions. My, my question to you is, as, as in your testimony you were talking about, you would follow the straw buyer from the, from the gun store, and it would stop. Did you all ever go beyond the first handoff of that weapon to, to trace them to where they were going? Go, go ahead. Uh, <clears throat> sir, not really, no. Uh, many a times what we would do is, we would have the information beforehand where they would call the FFL and say, hey, we're coming by to pick up 10 or 15 of these AK variant rifles, at which time the FFL would notify the case agent and we would begin the surveillance. We would often go to the straw purchaser's house and catch him before he leaves there, catch him as he, as he meets an individual uh, you know, at a car wash or a gas station. And so, and you, but you didn't follow that individual to no. move it up the chain. So if you were out to make a case against people higher up in the chain, wouldn't the next logical step have been following the gun that would, the next step? That would be very logical, sir. After he purchased the firearms and delivered them to another parking lot, and Special Agent Costa and I took pictures of them taking them out of one vehicle, putting them in another, yet we had to follow the straw purchaser back to his house while we knew the guns were headed the other way on the highway. 
I can't. I cannot tell you the logic behind and, and, that either. And we were given you mentioned in. What, go ahead. Did you have something to add? Yes, sir. We were given direction by the either the case agent or the group supervisor. We were literally pulled off of surveillances when we would make requests after a straw purchase uh, exchange had taken place. We requested, "Hey, this is a good opportunity to seize the firearms from an unknown person." Plus, we get to identify that unknown person. Plus, we might be able to move up the chain. And we were told point blank, time and time again, absolutely right. not, no. All right. So I apologize for going so fast. I have limited time. You say you built it one time. You built a tracking device from stuff you bought at Radio Shack. And then you had one out of the thousands of weapons. You had one that the agency provided for you that ran out of battery. Is that correct? Uh, to my knowledge, there was just the one, yes, sir. Yeah, so if you were trying to track guns, wouldn't a logical way to do that be embed some sort of tracking device either in the gun or its packaging? Sir, when, when the statement is made that we were trying to track these firearms, what that means is we were tracing them once they were recovered in the last crime they were utilized. Right, but if you're trying to make a case, uh, this is going up to the Mexican drug cartels and is involved in multiple murders and, you know, potentially bringing, you know, bringing bigger charges against these straw men for being part of a conspiracy, you'd want to see you know, everybody involved in that conspiracy. Oh, most you? definitely, sir. And, and what I would have done, I would have landed on these straw purchasers, and before long, I would have had that information for you. All right, so can, l let me ask you this. The policy we have, just following them and then quitting, do you, do you see any rationale behind that? Could you, could you come up with any reason we were stopping when we were stopping? Does it, any theory at all? Sir, I'll say this. Uh, for years, uh, when I first got to Phoenix, I was supervising firearms trafficking investigations, and we utilized trackers, and we did what you just pointed out. We'd, we'd make a car stop at the at the hand-to-hand -hand exchange, or, or we would seize the weapon if, if it got to a reasonable point where we thought it might go to Mexico. The, to answer your question, I've sat on many times to try to figure out what the logic would be to let these firearms go to Mexico, and I can't think of a single logical reason why this strategy would work. And you're not aware of any cooperation with the uh, Mexican authorities or any of our intelligence agencies that might be tracking these beyond Mexico or, or anything? I think if we were tracking them, we wouldn't see the tragic results we see when these guns get traced back from murder scenes. And were you doing anything to identify these weapons uh, other than recording the serial numbers, for instance, test firing them and gathering ballistics information or anything else? Sir, uh, no. The, the, the firearms are being sold and, and, like I said, in most instances taken out of the country. Uh, I know that once the Mexican uh, government takes possession of them, our, our assets in Mexico go examine them. Uh, and, and I'm not exactly sure. And, I mean, you, you work on the border. You realize Mexico takes bringing guns into their country pretty seriously. Well, I mean, just taking a shotgun to Mexico to go bird hunting is an experience. Yes, sir. So this is something our friends, our allies, and our neighbors would be very concerned about, and we didn't bother to, deal, to inform them. We did not. Thank you very much. I thank the gentleman. We now go to the gentleman from Pennsylvania, Mr. Kelly, for five minutes. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. And uh, I want to thank you, Special Agents, for appearing. I think, like everybody on this panel, we admire your courage and your patriotism for doing that. But my questions really are to the Terry family. And uh, Mr. Terry, I know how difficult it was for your opening statement. And I will tell you now that uh, as I'm in the autumn of my life, being the father of four and the grandfather of five, I think the unintended consequences of poor policies and procedures and failed strategies at some point somebody has to be held accountable for these things and, and as difficult as it may be for yourself and the Terry family. If the person responsible were in the room right now for Operation Fast and Furious, what, what might you want to say to them? And, and please, I think it's so important for the public to understand the purpose of these hearings. While we're very upset with the policies, it's important that people understand that there is a loss of human life here. So it's more than just a strategy that's failed. It's more than a failed policy and procedure. It is the loss of someone which is so near and dear to you. So your opportunity to do that, I would appreciate. Well, it is tough. Um, Brian was an amazing kid, uh, an amazingly brave kid that was willing to uh, put his life on the line. If that person were in the room, obviously, we'd want him or her to accept responsibility. Uh, right now, looking back at this uh, operation, 
it appears that uh, it has cost the life of, of our Brian. We hope and pray that it's not going to uh, result in any additional lives of U.S. Uh, law enforcement. But uh, I don't know if we can uh, truly, if that was truly going to happen. Uh, those guns are out there. So beyond accepting responsibility for these decisions and why, uh, we'd be curious to, to, to hear why did you feel that this was with, within that risk. You know, I've heard uh, from the ATF agents here that uh, even a mock-up weapon normally would not have been allowed to walk during these, uh, these operations. And, uh, you know, an awful lot of weapons walked and uh, we'd be curious to find out why. Ms. Blau, or Ms. Terry, anything you have to add? I don't know what I would say to them, but I would like to know what they would say to me. That's all I would say. Well, I know it's difficult, and I don't want to put you through in this, but I think it is incredibly important because the fabric of your family has been irreparably torn and can never be put back together again. And so the purpose of these hearings, really, is to make sure that nobody else has to go through the same thing that you have gone through. So I appreciate you being here. And with that, Mr. Chairman, uh, would yield the gentleman back. yield? I will yield back. Uh, the gentleman yields. Would you, the gentleman yield to the chair. Yeah, thank you. Yes, sir. I'll, I'm going to follow a line of questioning that I think I've been seeing develop throughout here with four law enforcement experts. You have two points, you know, the old, old expression, you, you know, you connect the dots. The first point is the straw buyer. The last point is the scene of the crime. You've said, each of you special agents, that in this case, as soon as you got to the next point of connect the dots, you were generally sent the other direction. You were not allowed to go beyond that next point. You weren't even allowed to follow that next point, even when they headed north with the weapons. Now, if an if a operation like Fast and Furious seems to have a pattern, a consistent pattern, that you're only looking for two points, the beginning and the end, it's not a criminal prosecution. It's not an effective one. Plus, of course, if you take the logic that you can't prosecute a straw purchaser if the gun's in Mexico, if you take that point, then that part of it was frivolous from the start, even though today every one of those straw purchasers has been charged, oddly enough, with the evidence that was available before that gun ever walked uh, beyond the, the first step. So let me just ask a question for your supposition, but I think it's a very well-educated one. If you only look at the beginning and the end of the dot, isn't the only thing you've proven that guns in America go to Mexico? Now, could that be a political decision? Could that be a decision that basically we just want to substantiate that guns in America go to Mexico, something we all knew but would have considerable political impact as Mexico began complaining about these, and they could say, well, yeah, we, we, even, we were even rolling up the straw purchasers. It wouldn't change the fact that Mexicans were dying at the bequest of the United States, but wouldn't it ultimately meet a political goal? I imagine, sir, that it's possible. Uh, in this instance, I think it's more just, as I said earlier, a, a case agent had had a bad idea, a group supervisor who failed to rein her in, an ASAC who failed to rein in. The chain of command all the way up failed. But you'd agree that it doesn't, re it doesn't meet any criminal uh, goal, goal of prosecuting the way it was handled? No, because you can't show the chain of, of how those pieces of evidence went from point A to point B, which you'd need to prove at a trial. I hope it was just a terrible mistake. Mr. Clay, you recognized for five minutes. Mr. Chairman, at this time, I have no questions for this panel in the interest of... I yield to Mr. Cummings. The, um, it seems to me that um, we do have a... There's something, there's some serious disconnects. And why that is, I, you know, I cannot imagine. And I want to say to you all, your testimony has been abundantly clear. But I want to, uh, for a moment, go back to Mrs. Terry. Mrs. Terry, um, you know, I often say, right now I'm, I'm preparing to do a eulogy on Saturday. And one of the things that I, th I thought about as I'm sitting here is 
part, I do believe that part of life is death, but also part of death is life. And what I mean by that is that, you know, we, we can't fully understand why somebody would leave us so young, particularly somebody like your son and your relative who was so full of courage and the fact that he was willing to basically die for his country. And we cannot always understand it. And I think we all struggle. We struggle with it, it's particularly when it's a young person. But I can say this, that I believe if, in my, deep in my heart that some kind of way out of his death will come life. In other words, the mere fact that we're here right now, Mr. Hayer, talking about this, the mere fact that this was not something that just shoved under the rug and just moving on, the mere fact that there are probably already changes being made to this program, and, and, and I think it was you that said it, that you wish you could, you wish you could say that this was the end of it, but there are guns still out there. But at least, and to the agents, I say this too, at least we are now moving in a direction where hopefully we reverse this and save some lives. That's why I said, Ms. Terry, sometimes out of death comes life. And it's not, nothing, 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 nothing can, I'm not trying to, you know, you, nothing can bring a person back. But, you know, because I wrestle with the question. I wrestle with it all the time of, of uh, why do so many of our best die young? And so that's why I said to you before, uh, Mr. Issa, the chairman Issa, asked me a question a moment ago about uh, cooperation in the Justice Department. And I, and I wanted to make it clear that I fought all my adult life trying to take guns, illegal guns out of hands of the of, of folks, period. It was you, Mr. Fraselli, and all of your testimony was absolutely brilliant. It was straightforward, no no frill, none just straight testimony. And that's why I appreciate it so much about it. But that what you said, I don't want us to, to lose sight of it. And even the chairman just talked about it to a degree. These guns don't just end up in Mexico. They end up in the United States too. You know, and, and, I, and, and, and they are not just killing people, used to kill people in Mexico. It's happening everywhere in our streets. And some kind of way, some kind of way, and as, and as I listen to Senator Grassley, he's right, we do need to leave the political piece at the door and try to figure out how do we address this problem. We gotta keep in mind too, Mexico is right next door. So basically in a sense, in a sense, if these guns are flowing to Mexico, basically what we're doing is turning a gun on ourselves or guns on ourselves. And this case is, is a tip, is a prime example of that. And so, you know, I just, I, I, I just, um, I just believe that we have to take this moment and make it bring life, bring life out of this, this, this very horrific and terrible death. And uh, with that, I yield back. I thank the gentleman for his comments. We now go to the gentleman from Florida, Mr. Ross, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And to the Terry family, I cannot imagine the emotional roller coaster that you have gone through and what today's testimony uh, does for you, but I can appreciate uh, that you are here, and I'm grateful for that. Uh, to our uh, agents that are here. Um, you know, th this, this investigation, as you well know, uh, relies in intensely on your testimony. And that not only in whole, but uh, quite frankly, in hopefuls that we find a, an answer at the result of this investigation to see that this never happens again. 
And, and to that end, I want to ask a couple of questions, and specifically to you, Mr. Casa, because I, I was here for your opening testimony and, and had to leave for some votes. But, but you mentioned that it was the rule rather than the exception, I think, to, to have the surveillance without the interdiction or the arrests. And, and, and was, was that, did I get the gist of it? For this investigation, yes, it was. And, and then you stated in your testimony, it has become common practice for ATF supervisors to retaliate against employees that do not blindly tow the company line, no matter what the consequences. Can you describe what any of that retaliation may have been? I would just say refer back to OIG investigations over the, the countless years uh, of Leola uh, attorneys that have represented ATF employees for all types of um, retaliation for whistleblowing. Uh, Punitive actions for whether that agent or inspector deserved the punitive action. For you, you mentioned in the, e the email that you received, you felt it was threatening. Oh, yes. And, and were you personally threatened by McAllister or English or anybody else? No, they're, they're, they're my equal or, you know, they're the right. same. They're, but my supervisor put in there, hey, if you don't like what, uh, what we're telling you to do, go work for Maricopa County Sheriff's Department. Uh, first of all, it was a horrible taste. Second yeah, of all, because there are brave men and women of law enforcement side by side with us in the I fight agree. against violent crime in the Phoenix area. What has happened to your supervisor since then? I have no idea. Is he, was any, were there, were there any repercussions as a result of his actions? And not, not as of yet. My understanding so is he, he's still in the same position, his supervisory capacity? Still, yes, I still understand he's a group supervisor. I believe he's in Minneapolis, St. Paul, currently still a GS-14 group supervisor. Now, you, you mentioned that, um, that, that, that they would that, that they would stop you from arresting straw purchasers and interdicting their weapons. Uh, were there other occasions when you were, your case agent told you to stand down and not make such arrests? I mean, in this investigation? Yes, in this investigation. Uh, again, it was, it was common. It was more than on one occasion. It was a few occasions. W was there one where you watched them come out with a bag of, 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 of guns, I guess? And yeah, uh, yes, and uh, one specific occasion, I wish I had more time. I'll try and be as brief as possible. Um, we observed, and in fact, I was with uh, Special Agent Dotson, and we observed uh, uh, individual go straw purchase. Uh, I believe on that day it was 10 uh, FN pistols, which, uh, by the way, they penetrate law enforcement vests. They're called cop killers. So, and that had to be particularly painful. Yes. And, and you saw this happen and you were ordered to stand down? We, we followed it. We followed the straw purchaser. We saw him transfer the guns to an unknown individual. Unknown. And I said, okay, I called, the, since I was a shift supervisor, I called the case agent and said, we need to interdict these firearms. And who was the case agent? Was that McAllister? Oh, McAllister. McAllister, okay. And I was told, no, stand down, do not interdict. I was given no explanation why, other than to keep on following the unknown individual with firearms. Well, he's street, he's street savvy. He makes a, a, a ten-person surveillance, each car over and over again, and to the point where he stops in the middle of a small subdivision in front of Special Agent Dotson and I, and he's a hot, lot higher up in a jacked-up pickup truck. We're down here, and we know he has at least ten FN 5.7-millimeter uh, pistols. And then I, I say, we need to engage. I call back in. Unfortunately, the group supervisor, who should have been there during the operation, or the case agent, who should have been there during the operation, they were gone for the day. They left. And there was no way to get in touch with them? Well, I was, I was told the point of contact at that point was uh, a probationary employee named Tanya English, who wasn't even a tenured ATF special agent. And I had to take my instruction from her, who told me, no, fall back, just re-surveil. But, like, but isn't that falling, that fallback, that resurveillance, isn't that contrary to what ATF policy should yeah. be? I mean, shouldn't the policy have been go in and make the arrest or yes. make inter interdiction? I'm sorry to cut you off. Yes, sir. Most definitely. Furthermore, it created a very serious officer safety issue. Yes. The guy knew he was being followed, but he didn't know by who. For all we, he knew, we could have been cartel members trying to rob him of those 10 guns, or we could have been law enforcement. He didn't, we don't know what he thought, but it caused a very serious officer safety issue. So, but for the grace of God, there could have been more than Brian Terry lost as a result of this. Yes, sir. Ms. Ms. Bailal, uh, just briefly, I've got just a couple of seconds. Is there anything that you think that your brother would want this committee to know about his life and about his service? Brian, Brian was about making a difference in justice, and I just feel that this country owes it to him because he spent his whole life fighting this country some way or another. I agree, and he is a hero. I yield back. I thank the gentleman. We now go to the gentleman from Arizona, Mr. Gosar, for five minutes. Mrs. Terry and the family, I'm deeply sorry. Um, I mean, as a father, I don't know. Uh, I, I just can, can just feel that pain. And I hope what I'm going to say next um, does not aggravate that in advance. Okay. Um, for the law enforcement folks, when you first heard about the shootings of Congressman Gabby Giffords, 
Was there a level of anxiety from the ATF fearing that one of the weapons might trace back to the operations of Fast and Furious? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Where did this anxiety come from and from whom specifically? Sir, I received a phone call from uh, my public information officer, who's a friend of mine, who said that uh, there was concern from uh, the chain of command that the uh, gun was hopefully not a Fast and Furious gun. Sir, I'd like to also add, every time there's a shooting, whether it was Mrs. Gifford or anybody, any time there's a shooting in the general Phoenix area or even in, you know, uh, in Arizona, we're fearful that it might be one of these firearms. Yes, sir. And th this happened time and time again when there was um, U.S. Embassy personnel killed in Juarez, Mexico. The fear spread through the division. Well, there's a reason I'm asking, because I'm feeling like, I mean, I I'm a dentist. I didn't participate in, in the military, um, but I understand that there is a chain of command. And I feel like I'm watching the movie A Few Good Men. And, you know, um, this wasn't done, you know, from what I'm gathering, you know, we've talked about uh, Special Agent Forcelli. You're talking about trying to get a jurisdiction in the New York courts. We're talking about the drug cartels. So we're not talking about something really simple here. So I guess my point is if, it, if, a, if a, an issue is this great, Typically before this one, if you've been involved in one, how far did it go up that people knew about something like that? Sir, I know I've had discussions with Sack William Newell, who's the special agent in charge, well, the former special agent in charge of the Phoenix Field Division. Um, the, uh, the supervisor, uh, the, excuse me, the assistant special agent in charge who was involved in this case when it first started was George Gillette. Uh, he and I had discussions where he pretty much just rolled his eyes when you voiced opposition to this. Uh, David Voth and I hadn't conversed much, he's in a different building, but I, I know from the review of a briefing paper that went up, that was prepared by either uh, Sack Newell or uh, vetted through Sack Newell by Mr. Gillette, that this was briefed at the highest levels of ATF. Uh, I've heard that Mr. Mr. Melson, our director, was aware of it. And, and what I find most appalling, sir, is that, that nobody has stepped up and, and had a statement beyond the Phoenix Field Division. I mean, there were tragic errors made here, and nobody has shown the decency and leadership to step up and say, hey, we made a mistake and we should have done something wrong. That's, that's what I find as appalling as anything else in this case, short of, of course, the tragedy that happened to the Terry family. That's absolutely right, sir. No one in ATF involved in this up to or acting director Melson has, has shown any significant leadership in this matter. And, and I can tell you, I know that our, our former group supervisor, Dave Voth, had to come to D.C. to brief our headquarters, um, DEA uh, Special Operations Division in Chantilly, Virginia, that he briefed EPIC on it, and obviously OSADEF was briefed because we secured the funding from OSADEF. Uh, I recall in March of 2010 when Acting Director Melson came to the Phoenix Field Division, spoke about the case, knew the case agent by name, the group supervisor by name, and I believe even some of the defendants or would-be defendants in the case. Well, I, boy, this is going in the, in the right way here. Um, you, you know I'm from Arizona. Yes, sir. Yes. Um, you are currently aware um, and have for some time that the uh, Department of Justice um, has had lawsuits against Arizona. Um, were you aware of any biases um, within your scope at ATF or comments in, uh, versus Arizona by the ATF or by the DOJ in regards to those? No, sir. No, sir. You're sure? I don't recall. It just seems like it, just this whole lax attitude, I mean, uh, from jurisdiction, from uh, timely and aggressive law enforcement um, that would create this. I'm getting this opinion because you said it, that you couldn't get a jurisdictional aspect of oversight in Arizona, and you took it um, to New York. Did you not, sir? Yes, sir, I did. Okay. Um, so it seems like a continued dismissal of actually jumping charges, and we've got a problem in Arizona. And, um, you know, we've seen a, a concerted effort that um, – uh, we've called out law enforcement um, on the border. I think it's specifically Sheriff Devers um, as lying. Um, I, I just see a lack of cooperation um, at, at, all the way across, and so does Arizona. And we see a very defunct um, uh, cooperative type of format that's becoming or trying to be uniform in adjudicating these laws. And we see it, I can tell you from Arizona, we see a very organized, orchestrated plan um, a lack of a plan from the DOJ, particularly with Arizona. Well, it's interesting, sir, and what I'll add is that the one thing I'll say emphatically is that I have had limited dealings with the Tucson office of the U.S. Attorney's Office. 
I've had extensive dealing with the Phoenix office. And again, in the Phoenix office, there are some good people, and I apologize that I've had to speak ill of that office, you know, but there is a distinct difference in, in attitude between the Tucson and Phoenix offices. The, the U.S. Attorney's Office in Tucson seems to be more amenable to working on cases with ATF, amenable to finding justice, than the U.S. Attorney's Office in Phoenix. And it's ironic because the U.S. Attorney himself and his immediate chain of command are based in Phoenix. <laughs> so that, that, that's all I can really Sir, add. Thank you. I thank the gentleman. We now recognize the gentlelady from New York, Ms. Burkle, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I want to begin by saying to uh, the mother of Brian Terry, Ms. Terry, I have six children, and my heart is broken for you because your life is irreparably changed. And I want you to know that um, what Mr. Heyer said about having someone step up and accept responsibility that will be the charge of this committee, and that's what we will do for you um, because of the loss that you all have sustained. You have my deepest sympathy. To the agents, thank you. Thanks for your courage for being here today and for your uh, forthrightness and standing up and doing the right thing. We appreciate that very much. Um, I want to begin um, with Ms. Terry. Can you, if there's a question that you would like us to ask, or find out. Can you share that with us? Is there something that's nagging you and you'd like the answer to? Well, mo most of my questions and answers are done by my nephew, Bob. And if I have anything to ask, I usually ask him and he gives me my right answers. Well, then I would ask Mr. Heyer, is there <laughs> a, a question that uh, you would like us to, to ask? I think, uh, We'd want to know if the dragnet that is set to find everyone involved in Brian's murder will be set deep enough and wide enough to encompass anyone involved in Operation Fast and Furious. If the guns used in Brian's murder were part of this operation, then we'd want to know Will everyone in that operation that had to deal with those we specific weapons be brought up on charges of facilitating the murder of Brian Terry? Thank you. We will ask that question on your behalf. Uh, there was a press conference held uh, shortly after Agent Terry's murder. And in that, during that press conference, Special Agent William Newell, he vehemently de denied that guns were walked. Uh, this question is for Mr. Forcelli, if you could, um, were you at that press conference? No, ma'am, I was not, but I watched it on TV. Okay. Uh, and, and did you hear him when he was asked uh, regarding uh, guns walking? Did you hear his response to that? The hell no response? Yes, sir. I did, ma'am. Okay. And, and what, what was your reaction to that? I was appalled because it was a blatant lie. Was he, he was aware? He that was, guns were being walked? Yes, ma'am. In fact, as I stated earlier, there was a briefing paper that was forwarded up to headquarters. Uh, Mr. Newell, if not the author, would have had his a ASAC prepare it, and it would have been forwarded through Mr. Newell. And, and I can tell you that Mr. Newell, as recently as two months ago, was stating that the case agent in this case should be getting an award. He still thinks this is an outstanding investigation, and I find it personally appalling. My, my colleague, uh, Dr. Gosar, brought up, he, he made an analogy between um, a few good men in this situation in the reminder. But with a good few good men, there was an order in place. There was a, this was what everyone followed. This was the policy. But my sense is, and I'd like to ask the three agents today, that what happened in this situation was not the ordinary course of business. And so if you could each comment on that. Ma'am, I can tell you as recently as three weeks ago, we conducted an interdiction of a 50 caliber belt fed rifle through a cooperative gun dealer. Uh, that individual showed up to pick up the rifle with cash and probably drug money. He was not a resident of the United States, but he had false ID. We had three trackers on the, well, two on the gun, one in the package, and we had uh, air support the whole nine yards. And once we got to a point where we realized we could not safely monitor that weapon, that individual was immediately stopped and that weapon seized and he was arrested. That's how we normally do business. And I can tell you, as a supervisor, um, no agents under my watch would have ever let a gun walk. I wouldn't have allowed it. 
Special Agent Casa, did you yes. want to comment on that? Yes, ma'am. Thank you. I'd have to back uh, exactly what Pete said. I, I'm working a number of investigations throughout what we're going through now. I'm still juggling them with everything else, and I would never let one firearm walk. I work with, um, I'm working a number of OCDF cases with other agencies, and I have to assure them, and, and they, they know who I am, that we will not let one firearm walk. We will stop that firearm at all costs, because one firearm on the street is one too many. That, each, that firearm can kill any one of us at this, at this table. That's all I have to add, ma'am. Thank you. Thank you. Special Agent Dodson? Uh, yes, ma'am. Prior to my involvement in Phoenix with the Fast and Furious investigation, in, in all of my ATF experience and my experience in local law enforcement, ma'am, I can tell you this, that we've never let a gun walk. I've never seen it authorized or allowed to let a gun walk. And if one even got away from us, like I stated earlier, nobody went home until we found it. Thank you all very much. Again, thank you for your service, for being here today, and to uh, Brian's family, again, our deepest sympathy. I yield back. I thank the gentlelady, and I thank our witnesses for their testimony. It's not a normal practice to have government witnesses along with the family or, or what sometimes are called civilians. But in this case, I thought it was appropriate that you all be there together. Uh, I appreciate all that you uh, have done for us today to have us better understand the situation. And Mrs. Terry, uh, although I can never guarantee the outcome, uh, about two years ago, we were able to name a Border Patrol station after three fallen Border Patrol agents several decades after they were killed. Uh, I've instructed my staff to work with the, the Border Patrol to find a mutually acceptable to you and the family location to name after Brian, and I will author that bill as soon as the location is determined by the family. And you have my promise that we'll do the other things that you asked for here today, that we will keep this from being political until we get to the full truth of everything surrounding this tragic uh, incident that we know clearly could have been avoided. I thank you and we'll take a short recess before the next panel.
come to order, please. We'll now recognize our next panels of, uh, panel of witnesses. Mrs. Josephine Terry is the mother of the late Border Patrol agent, Brian Terry. Ms. Michelle Terry is the sister of the late Border Patrol agent, Brian Terry. Mr. Robert Heyer is the cousin of the late Border Patrol agent, Brian Terry. The committee will, would also like to recognize other members of Agent Terry's family, including his father, Kent Terry, who is unable to be here today, his stepmother, Carolyn Terry, his older brother, Kent Terry Jr., and his younger sister, Kelly Terry Willis. Our thoughts today are with Agent Terry and his entire family as they continue to mourn the untimely passing of their loved one. Our remaining witnesses on the second panel are Mr. John excuse me, Mr. John Dotson. He is a special agent in the Phoenix Field Division of the Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, and Firearms and Explosives. <clears throat> excuse me. Mr. Olindo Lee, as he's known, CASA, is a special agent in the Phoenix Field Division of the Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, and Firearms and Explosive. And Mr. Peter Forcelli, is a group su supervisor of the Phoenix Field Division of the Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, Firearms, and Explosives. Ladies and, uh, and gentlemen, pursuant to the rules of our committee, all witnesses are to be sworn in order to testify. Would you please rise to take the oath and raise your right hands. Do you solemnly swear or affirm that the testimony you are about to give will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Let the record ref reflect that all witnesses answered in the affirmative. Please be seated. In order to allow time, particularly with such a large panel, your entire written statements and any in inclusive material you want to have put in the record will be placed in the record. So feel free to, uh, to summarize. Try to stay within five minutes. Uh, for the field agents, we will hold you closer to it. For the mother and sister, not so much. Uh, uh, we'll, start with, we'll, we'll start with Mr. Heyer. You're recognized for five minutes. Good morning, Chairman Issa, Ranking Member Cummings, and other members of the committee. My name is Robert Heyer. I, we expect in our brothers and sons a strong, competitive, handsome, courageous, funny, and incredibly patriotic American. Some of his coworkers even had bestowed him with the nickname of Superman. Brian was very proud to serve as a federal agent. He had joined the United States Marine Corps right after high school. He went on to college and earned a Bachelor of Science degree in criminal justice. He then became a local police officer in the communities of Ecorse and Lincoln Park, Michigan. When he sought to have more of an impact on keeping this country safe, he joined the Border Patrol. Brian, it seemed, had found his niche. Before long, he tried out and became a member of the Border Patrol's elite tactical unit, known as BORTAC. At age 40, he had much to look forward to, which included getting married and starting a family. But for now, he was living his dream. He wore his BORTAC winged insignia with great pride and excelled as a BORTAC team member. During BORTAC training, Brian was given a classroom writing assignment. The assignment was to write something about himself that would give the instructors some insight as to who he was. He composed a poem that he entitled, If Today Is To Be The Day, So Be It. I'd like to read you that poem so that you can have a better understanding of the man he was. 
If you seek to do battle with me this day, you will receive the best that I am capable of giving. It may not be enough, but it will be everything that I have to give. And it will be impressive, for I have constantly prepared myself for this day. I have trained, drilled, and rehearsed my actions so that I might have the best chance of defeating you. I have kept myself in peak physical condition, schooled myself in the martial skills, and have become proficient in the applications of combat tactics. You may defeat me, but I'm willing to die if necessary. I do not fear death, for I have been close enough to it on enough occasions that it no longer concerns me. But I do fear the loss of my honor and would rather die fighting to have it said that I was without courage. So I will fight you, no matter how insurmountable it may seem, to the death if need be, in order that it may never be said of me that I was not a warrior. Brian was due to complete his shift of duty that night in the desert. I'm the cousin of slain Border Patrol agent Brian A. Terry. As you know, I'm joined on the panel this morning with Brian's mother, Josephine, and his older sister, Michelle. They have asked me to give this opening statement on behalf of the entire Terry family. It was just 10 days before Christmas last year when our family received the devastating news. Brian had been shot and killed while engaged in a firefight with a group of individuals seeking to do harm to American citizens and others. We knew that Brian faced eminent danger on a daily basis as a part of his chosen career. But we also knew that he and his unit were highly trained and equipped with the best weapons this country could provide to their fighting men and women. They were confident in overcoming any threat that they may face in the desolate section of desert that they patrolled. He and his team prided themselves as being the tip of the spear that defended this country and its borders. The telephone call came in the middle of the night. I know this type of horrible notification has been received many times during the past 10 years by families of our military sons and daughters as the United States has fought wars in both Iraq and Afghanistan. After all, Brian had taken an oath to defend this country from all terrorist threats. What makes Brian's death so shocking to his family is that he did not die on a foreign battlefield. He was killed in the line of duty as a U.S. Border Patrol agent. He died not in Iraq or Afghanistan, but in the desert outside of Rio Rico, Arizona, some 18 miles inside of the U.S.-Mexican border. His killers were not Taliban insurgents or Al-Qaeda fighters, but a small group of Mexican drug cartel bandits heavily armed with AK-47 assault rifles. The rifles and the ammunition that they carried in those weapons were designed to do one thing, and that was to kill. Brian was an amazing man. And I say that not just because he was family. Many people thought he was almost superhuman. After his death, we visited his former duty stations in Arizona. Each time we met one of his fellow agents, they spoke of how impressed they were with him. He was outside of Rio Rico at midnight on December 15th, and then takes a much deserved time off. He had already made his travel plans to fly back to Michigan and spend the Christmas holiday with his family. Brian's attention to detail had ensured that all the Christmas gifts he had meticulously selected for his family had already been bought and sent in the mail prior to his arrival. Brian did ultimately come home that Christmas. We buried him not far from the house that he was raised in just prior to Christmas Day.
The gifts that Brian had picked out with such thought and care began to arrive in the mail the same week. With each delivery, we felt the indescribable pain of Brian's death. But at the same time, also remembered his amazing love and spirit. We hope that you now know a little bit more about our Brian. We ask that you honor his memory by continuing to ensure what he worked so hard to do and ultimately gave his life doing. That is, to keep this country safe and its borders secure. We hope that the Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, and Firearms is forthcoming with all information that the panel is seeking. We ask that if a government official made a wrong decision, that they admit their error and take responsibility for his or her actions. We hope that all individuals involved in Brian's murder and those that played a role in putting the assault weapons in their hands are found and prosecuted to the full extent of the law. Finally, it's our hope that no more law enforcement officers die at the hands of these heavily armed Mexican drug cartel members operating on and inside the borders of the United States. The Terry family would like to acknowledge and thank the special agents in the FBI's Tucson field office and the prosecutors in the U.S. Attorney's Tucson office that have worked so hard and continue to work in bringing Brian's killers to justice. We would also like to acknowledge the courage and integrity of the three special agents of ATF's Phoenix Field Division sitting with us on this panel, Lee Casa, Pete Forselli, and John Dotson. We recognize the professional risks you face by coming forward and speaking to the public about an investigation that you believe was ill-conceived and reckless. The Marine Corps has the motto of Semper Fidelis, which most of you know is Latin for always faithful. The Border Patrol has the motto of honor first. Brian lived a life of honor, duty, and sacrifice, which reflected both of these models and the two organizations that he was so proud to serve in. It is now up to all of us to put honor first and to remain always faithful in the quest for justice. On behalf of the entire Terry family, thank you. Thank you. Special Agent Dotson, you're recognized for five minutes. Mr. Chairman, Ranking Member Cummings. Please pull the mic a little closer, if you would, please, and make sure it's on. Yes, sir, is that better? Mr. Chairman, Ranking Member Cummings, other honorable members of this committee, I thank you. Beginning with my military service and continuing through to this day, I am proud to have spent nearly my entire adult life in service of this country under sworn oath to defend its constitution, with my allegiance always pledged to this republic. I have spent the vast majority of my law enforcement career conducting criminal investigations, with a particular focus on those involving the trafficking of narcotics and firearms. I have been involved in countless investigations and arrests, from basic misdemeanors to complex conspiracies of international drug trafficking organizations, many times as an undercover. I have made thousands of investigative stops and scores of arrests and have testified many times in federal and state courts across this country, often as a qualified expert. I do not appear before you as some remote observer of these events, casting a judgmental finger over the actions of others. I come, as I have been asked to do, bearing only my first-hand account. I have not the burdens of rendering judgment, determining responsibility, or holding others accountable. I yield those to this committee. The only message I hope to convey is that through this process, some resolve may finally be brought to the families of Brian Terry and Jaime Zapata, that we may truly honor their service and mourn their sacrifice. I hope that your inquiry and those of Senator Grassley's office and the Inspector General 
will yet yield a true account for the many others on both sides of our border who have already been or will be affected by this operation. Furthermore, I am grateful to have the opportunity to appear here today alongside the Terry family so that I may personally express to them my sorrow 